The weekend is not over, but what a weekend so far. What a day on Saturday, our first Saturday of a full slate of college football. Welcome into the Voice of College Football. This is what we do each and every Saturday night during the season. So if this is the first time that you've been with us during the college football season, this is a Saturday night staple right here, taking your questions, your comments in the live chat, taking your calls after a big day of college football Saturday night style. Of course, we've still got a few games going on. Alabama is ripping Utah State right now. That game is basically over. We do have Alabama post game on our Alabama and SEC channels, courtesy Zach Ramelius. So if you would like Bama post game with Zach, please check out our Bama channel. Also, USC and Rice, of course, uh, the Trojans score 66 in Lincoln Riley's debut with Caleb Williams and Mario Williams. And uh, Tim Prangley and Tony Altimore have our USC postgame, and you can catch that on the USC channel. And I believe they're still up and running, taking your calls and your questions and comments on USC postgame. All right, and a number of other postgame shows that we feature throughout the day here at the Voice of College Football for Nebraska, Michigan, and others, Miami. So please check out those respective channels for those postgame shows. But here we are with the national postgame show here at the Voice of College Football. So we appreciate you all being here. And, of course, the headliner of the night, Ohio State, in a much different way than many people anticipated. Knock off Notre Dame 21 to 10, a game that Notre Dame led for much of the way, 10 to 7 into the third quarter. And so that while the Buckeyes did not explode, while the Buckeyes did not showcase a prolific offense, this may be exactly what Ohio State needs. This may be exactly the type of performance, the type of challenge that this team needs long term. I actually think, especially with the second half performance being what it was, which was a 14 to nothing shutout of Notre Dame, that Ohio State winning in this fashion, running the football with Travion Henderson and Mayan Williams in the fourth quarter, playing shutout defense, exceptional defense, exceptional rush defense, exceptional pass rush. Mike Hall became a star tonight. We should have anticipated that based on the discussions we've had on our Buckeyes live show throughout the summer, that Mike Hall was ready to be a man, and he was a beast tonight, that this Ohio State performance was actually more impressive in many ways than had they gone out, put up three touchdowns quickly, had a lot of wide open receivers running downfield, a la against Michigan State and Purdue last year when they put up 50 and 60 points. And then kind of waltzed home to a win, 52-24, and the defense never really getting tested or having to prove itself or being able to rely on an offense that scored so many points that the defense could give up uh, 20, 25 points. It didn't matter. No. This could turn out to be a more impressive showing. And to me, in the second half, was a more impressive showing. Was it impressive and flawless? Of course not. The offense struggled at times, especially in the first half. But considering that maybe the best player at his position and maybe the best player on the field in the stadium, Jackson Smith and Jigba, couldn't play. And when he was on the field, he was compromised. He basically was a decoy. And the way Notre Dame played, Notre Dame is a good football team. Notre Dame is a solid, solid, strong, tough football team. And Tyler Buckner came out running the offense and running it well. He was obviously not intimidated by the shoe. Buckeyes win at 21 to 10. Would love to get your thoughts. I also was watching Florida and Utah, another great, great college football game. And in terms of coming down to the wire, better game than Ohio State and Notre Dame as Florida gets an Amari Bernie interception in the end zone, a diving interception cleanly caught in the end zone by Bernie after Utah had made a tremendous drive in the final 125 of the game 
after Florida had scored to take the lead 29-26, and the Utes only had 125 to go 80-plus yards, and they made it all the way down the field to the five-yard line and looked in perfect position with about 25 seconds left on the clock to be able to run two, three, four play, whatever they needed once they got a first down inside the 10 to win the ball game. And Cameron Rising was having a phenomenal drive. But he made a mistake on this play. The tight end fell down, but also the pass was not necessarily the best choice because even if Bernie would not have made the interception, there was another linebacker there or another defensive player. And Florida notches a huge win against the defending Pac-12 champion Utah Utes in Billy Napier's debut. Billy Napier off to a tremendous start at Florida. Who was expecting that? I went back and forth, back and forth on this pick and finally settled on Utah just being the more experienced team, the team that has its program settled and determined under Kyle Whittingham. Everybody knows their roles, the terminology, the relationships are built, all of it, versus a, a first-time head coach at this school, regardless of his success at Louisiana. Uh, that's pretty much what I settled on. And what we saw was two teams that could play 10 times and they could split 10. Uh, so nothing was determined that necessarily Florida is better than Utah, especially since they won the game in the swamp. Had that game been at Utah uh, Salt Lake City, you would think that the Utes would be better. And they, they might still be a better football team, but they weren't tonight. They didn't make the plays tonight. And Anthony Richardson, he's only played a half a season. He's thrown less than 10 touchdown passes in his collegiate career, at least going into tonight. I know he, through one or two, uh, but he's so talented that he's already a first round NFL draft choice. And tonight he showed that under adverse conditions against a very tough defense that he could make the plays with his arm, the dynamic ones with his legs, but with his arm for Florida to be a threat for Florida to be taken seriously for Florida to not be an easy out for anyone except unless your quarterback is Stetson Bennett and you play for that team. <laughs> we'll get to them in just a minute. Tremendous performance by the Gators against the Utes. And what I generally saw from the two teams were two teams that wanted to control the football. In, U in Florida's case, ran a very creative offense with the number of sets and different types of plays, uh, but where the defenses ruled – you know, the offenses moved the ball and there was some scoring, but it was 14-13 into the third quarter. Uh, but I think the defenses wore down. I think the heat and humidity got to Utah for sure. Probably got to Florida, at least on the defensive side of the ball with Utah just. And probably the biggest play of the game, other than Bernie's play at the goal line, which was, of course, needed, um, was Tavian Thomas's fumble. At the goal line, Florida held up at the goal line. Utah was about to take the lead at that point and may have won the game by two scores had Thomas not fumbled, uh, one of the best running backs in the nation. All right. Again, I'm Mark. It's the Voice of College Football. Would love to hear from all of you tonight. I will drop the link in the live chat. Also, keep in mind that this is the time to join Discord. This is the time. Check out the ticker below. Sign up on Patreon, search Mark Rogers TV. So go to patreon.com, search Mark Rogers TV. You get Discord, you get my picks as well. So the Discord is the chat uh, with all the other college football knuckleheads that you get in the chat there. And uh, they mix it up. I drop in there. I drop some comments and engage with you guys as well. But it's mostly about 85 at this point. And we would love it to be 100, 1,000. And we will go on from there. Uh, Discord, college football discussion. All the time, 24-7, 365. You can go in there at 3 o'clock in the morning. There's going to be somebody in there talking college football all the time. So please join us on Discord. But in addition to Discord, when you join us on Patreon, so you get the Discord link, and then also on Patreon, you get my picks, and you get the picks from other media members. And uh, I was a bit disturbed by a couple predictions that I made and a few that missed by a half a point. That's always annoying. 
Like I took Purdue in three and a half points. I picked Penn State to win the game. Purdue plus the three and a half. And of course, they lost by four. Had another two or three predictions like that where I missed by half a point, but had some other close wins. So it's probably going to even out, but it's just annoying because I was really close to having a great week. We will see how the numbers shake out. Of course, we still have games going on tonight with Oregon State and Boise State. I am DVRing this game right here. This should be a really good one. Oregon State jumped out on Boise 7 to nothing. And, of course, we've got the Sunday and Monday night games as well. Also, Mississippi State taking on Memphis. There was so many, so many delays. I don't know what's going on in the south. It must be tornado weather. I didn't hear about any kind of hurricane going through, so it must be, which usually completely cancels the games. It must be some kind of tornado storms, uh, lightning. Uh, probably 10 games today have been delayed, and most of those, all of them in the south, and most of those in Florida, Mississippi, Alabama. So I know that the Auburn game, on the Plains was uh, delayed. Game in South Florida was delayed against BYU. The Mississippi State game at home in Mississippi, that was delayed. A couple other games in Florida delayed. Other games in the Carolinas as well. Must be a massive storm in the South. I hope everyone's okay, and I hope everything is fine there. All right, let's get to your comments, your calls right here at the Voice of College Football. And uh, while you're at it, before you jump on in here, We've got 133 on the line. Hit the like button. And you know what? Get on out there and let people know that we're talking college football for the next several hours here at the Voice of College Football. Oregon State up 14 to nothing on Boise State. That's good news for me. I took Oregon State to cover the two and a half. All right. Again, you get my picks on Patreon. You also get the Discord link. And you also get the wild card selection by Steve Merrill from Wager Talk who had picked uh, Michigan to cover the 30 and a half, which the Wolverines did. All right, so let's drop the link and also get out there before we get this discussion started. Text people, call people, DM people, drop the link in social media, on Facebook, on Twitter. Let people know we're here talking college football on a Saturday night. This is what we do. All right, I've dropped the uh, link in the chat. It is my intent to always drop the link in the description section. I typically do. A lot going on today. I'm trying to track the games myself. Plus, we've got like 17 or 18 post-game shows. So I'm working through StreamYard issues with a lot of people, that sort of thing, especially week one. That's what we've got going. Uh, earlier today, what captivated me, during the noon hour, and for those of you who join us on a regular basis here at the Voice of College Football and have been through a college football season with us, you know that I typically provide a lot of instant analysis. Like, for example, I'll watch, I'll, I'll primarily watch, let's say, two games at noon. I'll be watching two games at the same time, and then when the games are over, I'll record a couple uh, instant analysis of those games and deliver those videos. I'll do the same thing with the 330 games. And I usually provide maybe four, three to four instant analysis. And if there's something really pressing, something really exciting, uh, I may jump on between the noon and 330 games, you know, jump on about 315 in the afternoon Eastern time and take us into the 330 window and uh, do the same thing, let's say at seven o'clock. The only thing I did today, even though I took tons of notes, and it, I had intended to provide some other content. But anyway, we threw out. And I know what teams are going to perform here on the channel. Uh, Michigan could play a 60 to nothing game against Hawaii. And if I shoot a Michigan video, people are going to watch it. As opposed to what I felt was the most important thing and the most intriguing result at noon was North Carolina State almost losing to East Carolina. Did you check that out? I was captivated by that game. I was watching... NC State 21-20 over East Carolina in which the East Carolina kicker missed a field goal. After he missed an extra point that would have made it 21 all, he missed a 42-yard field goal that would have won the game. And so NC State, this big chic pick of the ACC, and of course this doesn't affect their ACC championship hopes, but still coming out against East Carolina, they should have lost the game. Dave Doran 
dodged a bullet and so did NC State 2120. So I was pretty captivated by that and produced a video. So please check it out. Also at noon, what was the other game I really liked at noon? Oh, I was into the Rutgers Boston College game. I don't know if this speaks to the strength of the Big Ten, but I would guess that going into this weekend, and many of us would think that Rutgers is the worst team in the Big Ten, certainly in the bottom three or four, where Boston College is a mid tier. And a lot of people were expecting good things, big things out of Boston College. Rutgers went to BC. They were down the entire game. They were down by two scores in the second half. They came back and won 22 21. I was captivated by that game as well. Phil Jerkovic, excellent quarterback, tremendous, tough kid, plus talented. He's going to be an NFL starting quarterback. And Boston College, typically offensive challenged, has some really good wideouts and options in the passing game. Tactics, their tight end, is really good. Jalen Gill, the former Ohio State uh, commit, and signing really good, but Zay Flowers is a top-notch wide receiver. And so Boston College and Williams, the other wide receiver, really good. Uh, Garwo ran for 1,000 yards for Pat Garwo, the uh, top running back for Boston College. But Boston College is an offensive line. Bad pass protection. Couldn't protect Turkovic. Uh, Boston, or Rutgers basically had no passing game in this game, but they, Greg Schiano can coach. He, he patched together a win in this one over BC 22-21. So it's only one game. Let's not overreact. But still, one of the lesser teams in the Big Ten defeats a uh, pretty good team out of the ACC. All right. Uh, let's take our first call of the night. we got uh, Dustin on the line. What's going on, Dustin? What's going on, Mark? How you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. What's going on? <laughs> Oh, shit, I gotta go get my notes real quick. <laughs> get your notes. I got some notes, man. All right. Well, let's get the notes. Oh, get the notes. I probably should have also produced a video on Michigan's quarterback situation. I did. I did have the game on the entire time. I wasn't really watching it. Of course, they blew out Colorado State. I did notice that Michigan had no issues rushing the quarterback without a job O and Hudson. They were all over Millen, the Colorado State quarterback. So they win that one fifty one seven. What you got for Dustin? They were having a defensive meeting in the backfield all day yeah, today. <laughs> they did. Every like ten seconds. Uh, and then they'd regroup and then they'd meet back in the backfield. Yes. Yeah, it was great. At the old uh, line from the great defensive fronts in NFL history. Let's uh, let's meet at the quarterback. Yep, they were doing that all day. They did a good job today, man. I I, I kind of thought our defense was going to be really good this year. Um, I did not expect it to be like that, but I'll take it. Obviously. Oh, wrong damn picture. <laughs> anyway, uh. It, like most Michigan games, when we first start the season, seems like we always try to limit our playbook. And, I, you know, I think a lot of teams do that. So, Cade McManera did not play well today. I don't – I can't defend the guy. Uh, I do like him. But – did you see the post game interview? No. Kate McManero was like, he basically, it, it sounded like he was giving up. Sounded giving like, up. like he. Giving his, up the quarterback job? Yeah. He kind of was like, I don't know where I go from here, whatever my job is from here on out. You know, I'll fulfill it. I'll do whatever it takes, blah, blah, blah. It just sounded like he was defeated. And he was basically giving the job up to JJ. Well. It's kind of interesting. I've never seen, never seen a post-game interview like that. That was very strange. I'm looking for it right now. 
Hmm. He says, uh, McNamara's notes. Okay, so he says, uh, Coach mentioned that he wanted to. He doesn't really want to do this switching this year, McNamara said. However, it shakes out. That's just how it's going to be. I would definitely say it's pretty unusual. It was kind of a thing that I wasn't expecting by the end of camp. I thought I had my best camp. I thought I put myself in a good position, and that was the decision that Coach went with. I was confident with the way I performed over camp, definitely felt that way. But however, it's just not my decision. So whatever it is, however, you know, whatever my role is, I'm honored that my teammates recognize me for the role that I have currently. And that's about it. No. That's Pretty strange. Here. So we're watching it live, it, seeing his face and everything. It was, it was pretty strange, man. I, I ain't going to lie. That was one of the strangest uh, posts. Most game interviews I've ever seen. Um, obviously, he didn't play that great. He didn't. He just didn't. Um, what do you have? I think he had 146 yards passing. Almost had a pick there. Should have been a pick. He threw for 50% <laughs> accuracy. I think 9 for 18. And when JJ came in, threw for 100%. Accuracy, a touchdown, and rush for a touchdown. We're going to see here. You know, we got Hawaii coming up. It's not like it's another bit. It's just basically another scrimmage um, today, too. I mean, at the beginning there, I actually gave Colorado State there a lot of credit. Uh, three and out, first, first possession on us. And then... I thought, I thought all we, were, what we should have done, all all that we should have done today was really just pound the ball, pound the ball, pound the ball, pound the ball. Uh, that big ass defensive line that we, or offensive line that we have. I mean, they're probably going to win that award again. Uh, we were missing two starters on the offensive line, but we still dominated. Like you couldn't even get, couldn't get near our quarterbacks. Uh, we had some good runs. Obviously, Blake Corum's a pretty – he's like Michael. He reminds me of Michael Hart. He's little. He's hard to find. He comes through that line. He's got these big, huge linemen. He just kind of pokes out, and boom, he's gone. I, I think he's quicker and faster than Mike Hart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do too. Mike Hart would get caught, you know, by safeties and – uh, Blake Corum, he, he will too, but he, he has that speed. He had that, um, he leaped over one, one, of, I think it was a safety or a defensive back. Uh, one of the plays. Was yes, I saw that. Yeah. I mean, he only gained an extra yard or two, but still. Yeah, that's what I don't understand. These guys are jumping over guys all the time now when they used to do it. And, and if they had an open field where if, okay, you leap over this dude and you got an open field like you can keep going and get 25 more yards, I'm all for it. But these guys seem to be jumping over guys and there's a guy right there and they get they make like one more yard. Yeah. Whatever. It's it's a big injury risk to gain one or two yards. It is. I agree. But Dustin, did you get your uh, Patreon worked out, your Discord? Yep. I got on there. Uh Got my debit card today in the mail, so okay. I'm on your Patreon. I got on Discord. I actually just got okay. off the Discord there. I was on one, a couple channels there with on live talking to a couple people. Nice. We were going through some games there. We got some got some fans all over the country, man. You got USC, Utah. Um, oh yeah. So Dustin, of- what would you do with the quarterbacks next week? How would you handle that? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people are gonna hate me if I say it. I'm Do not. It. I don't give. Up, I'm not giving up on Cade. Uh, I love JJ. Um, he's gonna be the future. He is the future. And if he controls next week, he wins the job. That's fine by me too. But I'm gonna say, you know, Cade. Cade gets angry. Cade gets upset. He throws bullets. And he's a manager. But today, he had some plays 
I don't know what he was thinking or if he was just in his head too much, maybe. Because he had, if you go back and you can you can zoom out on the whole field and see the whole play develop, he he would bust out and have wide receivers wide open and could just throw the ball away or throw it into coverage. Like, I, it was so weird. Nothing like he was last. It was so it was not the same Cade from last year. It was like, what, what, what's going on? Like you got wide open dudes running across the side of the field, wide open. Like there's nobody. Like all you gotta do is throw a bullet, and he just threw it away, or threw it into coverage, drop balls. Well, didn't use our tight ends. That 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 was surprising. Yeah, like we were, all had one catch. I saw yeah. that catch. It was a great catch. It was actually a really good throw by Cade because he was running right. He had a rush against him, and he threw it kind of across the defender. And, uh, yeah, all made a great catch. Yeah, caught it, at his, caught it at the hip, basically, almost through coverage, too. It was beautiful. You know, when he throw, when he has his play, when he throws that ball, like, he's got, be- he's got a beautiful technique. I don't know what was going on in his head today. Man, he was – he was not the normal K that I'm used to from last year. So Dustin, one last uh, talking point, we got to move on and get through these calls. We got about five people lined up here would be that. uh, And thank you so much for the super chat. I appreciate that. I'll read that in just a second, but thank you for that. That um, so, so today was almost like 2021 where K's the starting quarterback. They're going to bring in JJ uh, to give the defense a different look, to give him some reps, to give him a series, to let him run a little bit. Like you say, he went four for four. He looked good. I saw his passes thrown. Uh, but at the same time, like when they start JJ next week, you wonder if they're going to bring Kate in. Uh, because in, in, in one way, it would be fair for the competition, but Kate's not like a changeup like JJ is. So it's kind of different. I don't think I don't think we're going to see that next weekend. Sure. It's going to be JJ all, all game and We'll get a lead, and then you're going to see uh, or- Orgy <laughs> and uh, whoever the other guy was. I can't remember his name. But, yeah, I, I don't think Cade's going to – he might come in for a couple plays next weekend, but I honestly don't think he's going to be much of a playmaker at all for the next – you know, against Hawaii. Yes. Uh... He'll be there for the backup. Orgy, the name the I, I first heard during uh, the, the spring game, and I don't think I've heard anybody say it without chuckling. Yeah, but was it Robert Griffin the third kept saying, I'm not going to go there, I'm not going to go there, and then he – Oh, did Orgy, he play today? Yeah, Orgy scored a touchdown, oh, he? a oh, rushing he touchdown. And, uh, oh, he ran for a touchdown, I see it there. Gotcha. RG, RG3 was like, there's an Orgy in the end zone. <laughs> Well, he did go there then. Yeah, he did. He kept saying, I'm not going there. I'm not going there. I'm not going there. And then he scored a touchdown. He's like, there's an orgy in the end zone. <laughs> right, Dustin. We appreciate you stopping right. by, man. Hey, call take anytime. care. All right. Uh, before we get to the next call, we got Aiden on the line to talk Buckeyes, I'm sure. Thank you so much for the Super Chat. Dustin, Michigan's defense today. Yes, Colorado State or, I mean, Nevada. Yeah, Jay Norvell course making the transition from nevada to colorado state i give michigan a b minus Cade, his post-game interview did he just surrender i can't imagine so dustin told us about a bunch of comments that Cade mcnamara made that sounded like he was giving up after going nine for 18 today but uh, i didn't see him here uh chi day do you agree with notre dame punting on their possession meaning near the end of the game on fourth and 21 i would guess they punted uh, with about four minutes left. It was fourth and 21. They were down 11. Yeah, that's that's a situation where for sure you go for it if it's fourth and manageable. Because basically, depending on how many timeouts you have, okay, you're down 11, four minutes left. You're punting from your own end. So it's not a field position thing where you can pin them deep, even though that punter ripped a punt to like, the other inside the other 15 yard line uh, depends how many timeouts they had. And I wasn't keeping track of that uh, because you could pretty much 
get off the, you know, Ohio state's going to run the ball. You can get off the field in three plays and only burn 20 seconds, but you've exhausted your timeouts. You get the ball back down 11 with let's say three and a half minutes left. So that's, that's what you're wrestling with right there. All right. Uh, super chats. Saw one from Antoine. We also have, uh, Jersil Love 3, I guess. When is the last time an SEC team even went out west for a big game? I'm being genuine because something my duck stood no chance in Atlanta and uh, Utah lost. Okay. Um, yes, I understand that that's not a neutral site game. For any Oregon fan going into that situation, I understand it's like playing in Athens. But... 49 to 3. So <laughs> if the game would have been played at Oregon, what was it going to be? 38 to 6? Okay. So <laughs> you're not making up 43 points anywhere. Uh 46 points. Uh Georgia as it seems right now is one of the two best teams in the country. So okay. So I understand you're upset about a neutral site game not being a neutral site. But that was the deal that Notre, it, nobody forced Oregon to sign the contract. So blame your administration, your athletic program for signing the contract. If you don't like that, you, you, you don't blame Georgia. You don't blame the SEC. You don't blame anybody. Oregon scheduled the game. Okay. Uh, yes, Utah lost, and we're going to have to see how good Florida is because, as it stands right now, maybe the best team in the Pac-12 lost to throw your hands up in the air. The fifth best team in the SEC, the tenth best team in the SEC, uh, and that two on the road. So that that played into it heavily, no question. And uh, another super chat from Antoine. Appreciate Antoine being here. He says Ohio State in trouble. They missing Olave and Wilson. Yeah, I think the positives that came out of Ohio State's performance far outweigh the negatives. They will score points. They they found they beat up a Notre Dame team in the second half that's a physical, physical football team. I understand what you're saying. They didn't I think anybody that really understands football and understands what Ohio State's gonna have to do this season would rather see what happened tonight, even though it wasn't pretty. It wasn't 54 to 20 and it wasn't 600 yards passing and six touchdowns. What they did tonight, they're going to get there offensively. Don't, don't worry about that. As long as Jackson Smith and Jake buzz. Okay. They're going to be fine. Offensively. They found a defense. They found a, a power running game. No, that's a positive performance for Ohio state. I know they didn't, Cover the spread, uh, all you Ohio State fans, and even just general college football fans. What I, how I've been saying for eight months, this game's not going to be a joke. I said that the entire offseason. I said, this game, this team is no joke. Just seeing these scores, 52-20, 51-24, everything. It just I was like, no, no, it's not going to be that. All right, let's keep it going with Aiden. How you doing tonight? What's up, brother? I'm good. Man, Michigan's defensive line looked really good. Uh, Ohio State's? And Michigan's, too. I mean, I know it was a yes. Well, yeah, Michigan but... was playing a little bit <laughs> different brand of football team for their but... defensive line to look impressive. But... Well, still seven or eight sacks for a missing Ojabo and Hutchinson. I sure. I mean, because I was really concerned about that uh, defensive line going into the season. But, uh, yeah, Ohio State actually found a defense. So, uh, I mean, I think, honestly, again, Ohio State fans should – rather take the fact that they actually found a defense and a running game over just covering the spread. 
Yeah, who cares about covering the spread? That's not Ryan Day's job. And anybody out there, I've been telling you for eight months, they're not covering the spread. So, because listen to me. I mean, now, now I have this weird feeling that they might lose to Penn State. Okay, maybe. Yeah, because I can see that. I feel, I feel like, you know, they did find that defense in that power running game. What you saw Notre Dame do is what Ohio State's probably going to see almost all year. Sure. Just keep their two safeties back. And, I mean, say what you want about uh, Manny Diaz as a coach, but he is an elite defensive mind. And I think Penn State has a top 10 to 15 secondary in the country. Oh, they're better than that. But I'm with you. I think they could have a top 10 to 15 defense in the country. They did last year. I think their secondary is better than that. But I'm with you. Keep going. Uh, I'm not necessarily on board with Manny Diaz being an elite defensive mind. But I also think that uh, Penn State's running game is going to be improved with those two freshman running backs they have. It, It can't be any worse than it was last year. It's almost impossible, statistically impossible. Oh yes, it will be better. Yep. And I did think those freshman running backs did look good in that uh, Purdue game. Yeah. Oh, I agree with you. They did. But do you realize that for as good as they looked, and that was their first game, um, Katron Allen and uh, Nick Singleton, that was their first game, that both of them went like nine carries for 25 yards. Yeah, because the offensive one couldn't. Uh, block for them. Yeah. So that offensive line that Penn State showed us against Purdue and the same one that they played with last year is going to face this Ohio State defensive front. So I agree with you that Penn State's going to be a challenge. Uh, that's an interesting game. And that's kind of the game I had in my mind when I picked Ohio State to go 11 and 1, pretty much. So I'm right there with you. But. Um, mm. Yeah, Ohio State's a better team than Penn State, but that doesn't mean they can't lose. Um, I'm the right there with Drake Knapp, who says that Manny – I do not consider Manny Diaz to be an elite defensive coach. I don't know what he's done in the past that would point to him being uh, on Brent Venables or uh, you know Will Muschamp's level. Uh, and they, and they played you and they played you close last year, and now that game's at home. Sure. All right, man. Anything else? But uh, but uh, I also think the Pac-12 will uh, play themselves out of a playoff spot. I want to get your thoughts on. That. Well, they're on their way. <laughs> they've they've taken I mean, a huge step toward it tonight. I mean, uh, Oregon yeah, got their, there. Two of their I four mean, best teams lost games. Um, Oregon could have lost, but looked good, and of course they didn't. Utah needed to win that game. Now, if Utah goes and wins the Pac-12 and wins every game in the Pac-12. Yes, a Pac-12 champion with an out-of-conference loss, and that being the only loss, could still make the playoff. But yes, what happened to the Pac-12 today was a huge blow to the conference. But but I'm, I'm just going to call it like it is. Florida, as of right now, we're going to have to see how good they are. Is like probably the fifth or sixth best team in the SEC. Okay. So, I just think even if they do go undefeated and you have, like, a one-loss Georgia or a one-loss Michigan that barely loses to Iowa State, hypothetically speaking, I mean, is the committee going to be like, huh, are we going to put this Utah team in that a loss to the fifth or sixth Best team in the SEC, as we're looking at right now? Depends how they perform for the next 12 or 13 weeks. 
uh, because this game's on their resume, but it's also, you know, that that's that's one of the age old debates of this playoff is are we selecting the teams with the best resumes? Are we selecting the teams that are the best right at the end of the season? Um, because that game is the first game of the season. And if Utah outplays this game and it, and it wasn't a bad performance, depending again, like you say, how Florida turns out. All right, Aiden. I mean, Anything Florida else? could turn out to be a 9-10 win team. I'm just a little yeah. bit hesitant on that right now because of what's sure. around Anthony Richardson. Yeah. All right, man. All right. Well, I'm going to well, I'm going to let you go. All right. You know. Thanks, Aiden. Hey, we appreciate it. Have a good one. All right. Uh Joey says uh take my money, Mark. Thank you, Joey. Appreciate that. Gladly. We'll do that. If you force me to, in all caps, I will do it. And we got Ben on the line to, I'm sure, talk Michigan. Bilal, thank you so much for the contribution. Appreciate that. Bilal's got nothing to say, at least on the super chat right there. But thank you so much for the contribution. Bilal, I would think, is uh, a happy camper tonight with the Buckeyes winning. Uh Jersil of three. Don't get me wrong. I just wanted Oregon to put up a fight, but it's like, dang, what's the point? Same goes for other teams. They play neutral sites versus the SEC. Well, yes, the SEC's big, been big on neutral site games, especially Alabama. Florida doesn't travel anywhere. Almost no one travels anywhere. However, if you look at Alabama's schedule starting this year, going to Austin, Texas, they're starting to loosen that up a little bit. The last time you had, you had made a mention of the last time that the SEC went to the West Coast. I do recall Tennessee going to Oregon, what about 10 years ago? They played a home and home with Oregon about 10 years ago. They got whipped. I think both times, or one of the games was close, but they lost both games against Chip Kelly. Uh, I remember UCLA and Georgia getting together, but that was a long, long time ago. Um, yes. Well, Ole Miss went to Cal just a couple of years ago. They played a home and home, Ole Miss and Cal. I know that's not what you're looking for. You're looking for the upper echelon of the SEC. Yep, that's why we need a committee. We need, for as much as I hate a college football playoff committee, but the our committee – would be tied to metrics. They wouldn't be able to make too many decisions. There'd be uh, a narrow uh, opinion portion of it um, to, to put the formula in place. And we wouldn't have situations where Florida has not played a Pac-12 team since 1989. That's ridiculous. All right. Uh, Ben's on the line. Ben, how are you doing today? Hey, Mark. I didn't actually necessarily call to talk about Michigan. Oh, today. okay. Yeah, I was actually interested. I think it's more interesting to talk about Ohio State in that Notre Dame game, especially as it pertains to the Big Ten. Okay, I agree I think with we... you, And it's always more, uh, more interesting to talk about Ohio State than Michigan. I agree with you there. Yeah. <laughs> that particular game, I'll give you that. Because we played a high school today. Well, no, I can't I can't say that because I would, that's just not respectful to uh, – no, to not. Colorado, so I won't say that. I should I take it back. But anyways, um, my take. Michigan's not traveling to Fort Collins, Colorado, to play them, are they? <laughs> okay, so they at least traveled and yeah, yeah, went out for there sure. for butt kicking and a yeah, but they also got a good paycheck too for yep. it too. <laughs> I'm sure they did. Probably about a million three seems to be the going rate these days, somewhere yeah. in that range. Yeah, and that keeps this those those schools and, and well, anyways, we know that. What what I want to talk about, um is I think the narrative people are taking – my narrative – I think my perspective on the game may differ from what other people are okay. looking at Ohio State. I, I When I look at that game, I look at – to me, I I look at what I – I think Ohio State's offense, even though they may have looked slow tonight, I also was watching in Notre Dame, and they were almost – almost selling out for the pass and the comeback pass. Like there was a few times where the, there was no, nothing but 
I mean, if they would have took the, if it would have been a deep shot instead of a comeback, the guy, the, the field was just clear. I mean, there's a couple times the receiver came back and that was just the route. If he would have, if he would have went deep, he would have been burnt. I mean, he would have just been wide open because the safety was coming up for the comeback before the guy even made his cut. And if the guy just, just kept going, it would have been, I've seen that a couple times and it just, I, I think they kind of sold out for that because that's Ohio State's. Their their I think that's their style of pass is most of it is when the they send the receiver to on a comeback route. Um, so I think maybe that was even a little bit of a, a kind of a, a school on how to play Ohio State or how to play their how to play their um, against their receivers. Um, but then, you know, Ohio State ju- adjusted and to just pound the ball down their throat. But I, yeah. at the same time, when I look at the defense, I'm not, I still have question marks at the defense outside of the ball of Ohio State because I'm not so sure uh, how well, how good uh, Notre Dame is. I think if Michigan would have been in the place of Notre Dame's, I think if Michigan's offense would have been in the place of Notre Dame's, Michigan would have been punching them in the mouth, so. Or a team that had, I'm not sure how 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 good the offensive line was was for um, Notre Dame, and I think it you know we'll have to wait and see how the games play out. And I'm I think that quarterback for being for you know being you know a new starter played pretty well. I think he did what you would expect from him. But I, I'm not. I'm just not sure on on the Notre Dame offense. I'm not completely sold. Well, Notre Dame did lose some key members of its offense. Uh, one in particular would be Austin Davis, probably their fastest wide receiver in fall camp. So that hurt quite a bit. Uh, they lost their best running back from last year, Kyron Williams, but he wasn't necessarily their most explosive back. The guys that they have playing with them now, Estemi and. Uh, Chris Tyree is a burner. Um, I'm not really with you on the offensive line portion of this because, first of all, the premise to everything we talk about in week one and probably even in week two, but especially week one, is somebody beats somebody and then we're always questioning, well, how good is that other team? Mm-hmm. That's We can say that about – technically, we can say it about everyone. Nobody's going to say it about – Alabama nobody's going to say it about Georgia but we could say that about everybody you know how good are they how good Penn State struggled but they beat Purdue how good's Purdue well uh I think we we probably know how good Notre Dame is we probably know that Notre Dame is one of the 10 or 12 best teams in the country but are they where do you think their offensive line stands well I because know I that think that's often... an important important part when it comes to this sure and it's an important part based on what we saw tonight. I get it because Ohio state struggled uh, against two offensive lines that were really good last year. So what we know about Notre Dame is that for the last five or six years, they've arguably had the best offensive line in the country. I don't mean every year, but I mean collectively Mm -hmm. over the last four or five years, but their offensive line play last year wasn't quite as good as it was before that. I do know for sure that they have two high, high draft picks on that offensive line. And I'm pretty sure the other guys will play in the NFL. At okay. least four out of the five. So and I'm not familiar. And not it's part of part of this is a learning thing for me because I'm not familiar with their offensive line or the, or their I mean any of their depth chart really. Yeah. Well Jared, other than other other than other than uh, what I gather from Will in the country. And their quarterback situation. <laughs> yeah, and their quarterback, um, did he play well for a first-time starter playing a good, a talented defense? I'm not going to say it's a good defense because it was pretty bad last year, but it's talented, and maybe it's good this year. We'll see. Uh, he played well, but did Ohio State benefit from playing a first-time starter? They, you know, they weren't playing Bryce Young. Uh, but Buckner played well. He didn't make mistakes. He didn't throw a pick. He didn't throw a ball that should have been picked. He pretty much 
basically he went eight for eight to start the game and he was he was running the offense well and then they started to get a lot of pressure on him and he finished like only like two of eight but it wasn't because he was throwing the ball poorly he was just sitting on his rear end the rest of the game yeah well i yeah that's just kind of want to throw at you um i can't even remember the other point i was going to make so i'll just step out and let somebody else come in and I'll uh, catch you later, Mark. You have a oh, I well. The one other thing I wanted to say it was a good. I did enjoy the game. I enjoyed that game a lot. And it, <laughs> despite what you may think, I was actually hoping Ohio State won because we need every bit of strength on our schedule we can have. <laughs> so, anyways, but I wouldn't have been. I wouldn't have cried if they would have lost. But it was a great game, and I enjoyed it right until about the fourth quarter, and then it started. You knew. You knew Ohio State was going to win. But have a good one, man. All right, Ben. Thank you so much. All right. Be get, before we get to uh, another Ben, uh, Joey, appreciate you being here. Manny Diaz is a hell of a janitor, though. I've not heard that. But I, I think he can probably, probably stay in the coaching ranks. I think he's doing pretty well at this point. But not elite. Nick, can you drop the call in link in the chat? I just did, Nick. Thank you so much for the super chat. Appreciate that. Now, I don't know what kind of mood Ben's going to be in, but we're going to pick him up here and we'll see. Oh, you're, you're muted or something. There we go. Be respectful. I'm the best, Ben. <laughs> you're the best, Ben. I'm the best, Ben. Uh, my mood is up and down today. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> I'm not Ben's even going to get in here. Today, everyone. Was that? I said Ben's moody today, everyone. No, 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 no. I, you said up and down. Isn't that I was moody? moody? I was moody earlier having to do an hour live post game by myself following that game. That was no. that was rough. <laughs> well, I that, was, that was pretty rough. I appreciate it. You knew that that was possible. Oh, oh, no, expecting it not that bad, but, yeah. Yeah, I didn't think that was going to happen. I have had 42-17 in my head most of the offseason. That, yeah, that was that was, that was was bad. Um, you can go to the Oregon channel here on Voice of College Football and see that, and it's um, a little more optimistic than I look right now. But, uh, yeah, I'm not even going to talk about Oregon. I'm not even talking about Oregon. a nice little. I, I didn't get a chance to check it out yet. Did we have a, a nice little uh, discussion on Oregon football? A nice chat. Yeah, we had some. Uh, we had some good discussion. Some people were okay. very uh, downers, but you know, I mean, understandable, understandable, yeah. understandable, understandable. Uh, it's the same. The, like uh, your last caller was saying, you know, and like we were just you were talking with him. Though it's week one, we don't know what these a lot of these teams really are. Georgia looks really good. Alabama, you expect them to be really good. Utah losing on a... I don't even know where he was throwing the ball at the end there. Right? Yeah. right. He That's threw it towards the ground. Florida picked it off, like, off the turf and, you know, picked it off to end the game. That, when I was watching the replays on that, Ben, uh, one of the announcers, which is it's a, it was a great announcing team, but on that particular play, they were making excuses that the, the tight end was falling down. Well, the tight end was falling down, but he, there were two defenders right in front of him. He was trying yeah, no, to throw right. the ball through two people. Yeah, he, he threw it yeah. towards the ground. But still, yeah, I'm like, I don't know where he was throwing. It was it was a good game. It was a really oh, good game. game. Really good game. Um, and that was either first or second down. They had plenty. Like, he didn't need that play. I th think that was second down. Yeah, I think that was second down. They were out of timeouts, so they – kind of had to like throw it but at the same time you could have just thrown it away yeah so really good game though really really good game uh notre dame ohio state people were talking about and i uh, like we say we don't know how these teams are going to fare in the season because i mean you look last season notre dame was really good but they almost lost to fsu in we <laughs> you know so you don't know what these teams are going to be or if they're going to progress or how that first week impacts teams because they have so much time to plan for each other. So, yeah, you, you just never know how this is going to go. Uh, I'm not going to take up much of your time because, yeah, it's been a long day, especially with that post game. But I do want to shout out Connor. He might call in. 
Uh, but I want to shout out uh, almost halftime. The Beavers are up 24 nothing on Boise yeah. State at home. Beavers are looking good as expected. So shout out to Connor uh, and all those other pesky Beavers. As expected, though, as only a two or three point favorite in this game. This game was, yeah, it was, a, it was a close spread. They're tearing them up. That's why the Utah one was so fabulous because it was only a like a one and a half point spread, I think, and they lost by three. So it came right down to the wire as expected. But yeah, this one was like not that big of a spread on this game at all. But go Beavers. And uh, I'll make a quick plug to you, Mark, or on your show right now for you. Tomorrow night, following the FSU LSU post game show on Mark Rogers TV right here on the main channel. College football after dark, 1215 or 1230 Eastern time AM late, late. We will be live for you guys because there's a lot of football to talk about. Well, Ben, do this for yourself and everybody else involved. Just just go on whenever you want. Just nope, go that's, on fine. You can. that's fine. That's uh, fine. Be- because, because we can have two streams on at the same time. And that Florida State game, I don't know when they kick off, 8 o'clock. They won't be off till like 11.30. So. Something like that. Well, you know what? Actually, I'm going to be on the – that's what we're going to do tomorrow night. Uh, our guy, our guy uh, Lon Phillips Sullivan, our LSU guy, he is going to do LSU post here. I'm going to be on the Florida State channel focusing on Florida State. So, yeah, start whenever you want. Okay. All right, then maybe we'll move a little earlier. Well, then look for the live alert tomorrow night uh, for CFB After Dark Week 2. We will be here somewhere on the main channel at some point tomorrow evening. Uh, yeah, let's go 11, 11.30 Eastern. And that is now the official title, CFB After Dark. We'll leave it College Football After Dark for College the title. Love it. College Football Love After it. Dark. We'll leave it that. All right, Mark, you have a great show. And uh, go Beavers, be Boise State. Thanks, Ben. Yes, college football after dark. These guys got together last Sunday. I sat and watched the whole thing. Like I was, that's right. I have to put together a Big Ten podcast that is due at the end of the day on Sunday, which is going to be difficult to figure out tomorrow. But anyway, that's my issue, not yours. Uh, But we've got a Big Ten podcast uh, that we post on the college football coast to coast network that is really strong because there's a lot of great people doing great work on there. And they asked me to do a Big Ten podcast. So we got the Big Ten paradigm. We posted our first edition last uh, Monday, first thing. So the same thing this week. And why did I bring that up? Yeah, because we're going to do post game here. Um Ben and the boys are going to be here college football after dark. And they like let you guys flood in like eight at a time and just have a free for all and talk college football and recap the weekend and all that. We're also going to have LSU post game here. We're going to have Florida state post game with me off to be the Florida state expert on the Florida state channel after the game tomorrow. Uh, Dustin, thank you so much for the super chat. Much appreciated, man. I hope you know that everyone get on Mark's Patreon and discord I was on it most of the day talking live football with fans across the country. It was fun, worth five bucks. That's five bucks a month. Sign up on patreon.com, search Mark Rogers TV. Then we've got uh, Mamba24. That's got to be a Kobe fan, right? With how Cade played today, I think JJ will start. Huh? That's a reasonable assumption. All right. Anything else coming in? Yes, we've got uh, Joey coming back here. Appreciate you, Joey. Jed Fish doubled his win total today. Happy for the guy. You know what? If I have time, and I say this all the time during college football season because there's so many games that I don't get a chance to see, even though I'm sitting here from noon to midnight watching college football, um, Arizona beat San Diego State by two touchdowns. And San Diego State has been a really good football program for the last 10 years. And I would assume to a certain extent they were supposed to be good this year. So that's a nice win for Jed Fish in Arizona to win and hold San Diego State to 10 points on the road. 
So I'll have to check that one out. Jay Dub's on the line to talk some college football. Jay Dub. Uh, good evening, Mark. And of course, the overreactions sure. are piling in for everybody. Uh, there were a couple of lucky teams today. Uh, North Carolina, extremely lucky to escape <laughs> Appalachian State. Uh, North Carolina State, who I don't understand all the love for them all during the offseason. Uh, yeah. Unbelievable that two short misses like that saved they them. They were really lucky. You know, it's yeah. one thing like North Carolina, for as bad as their defense was, which I'm still trying to wrap my head, J-Dub, around giving up six touchdowns in a quarter. How is I don't know that how you do that. Unbelievable. Like, you wouldn't even think there's enough time to do that, especially right. when North Carolina's offense is keeping the ball and scoring points itself. But anyway, they gave up six touchdowns. At least they made a play at the end. They at least swarmed to the football, tackled the dude before he got the two-point conversion. I have no defense for teams that win in the manner North Carolina State did when they just the other kicker just kicked them wide, you know. Too straight. Yeah. Well, they didn't do anything to win the game. Uh, but, you know, they did things to win the game, obviously. But, I mean, in the end, um, yeah, that was that was lucky. Well, then we have the, uh, hey, didn't you used to be the Pac-12? <laughs> and I agree with you on Ohio State. I think uh, the people are thinking, well, where's the 50 points? Well, you know, I don't think Notre Dame's offense is all that great. I don't think their offensive line is as great as everybody thinks it is. But Ohio State might have found a little bit of defense today. Now, they were probably very lucky that that wasn't Georgia or Alabama they were playing tonight. Sure. If that had been Georgia or Alabama out there, they might have gotten real ugly, even in Columbus. But they did what they, they, did what they needed to do. They took care of business. And this is not going to be the Ohio State that you see in the middle of September, the middle of October. Uh, they're going to be just fine and just every bit as dangerous as everyone expects them to be. The, uh, the, the score that surprised me the most today was, and this, imagine if you had to sit through this, seven to oh. three. Yes. Uh, uh, imagine, imagine that. Oh, I Jay saw. Dub, a post, keep going. I saw a post saying that's the first seven to three score in which the team that scored seven points got there by two safeties and a field goal since two thousand. That's the only way. And you for can a do long it. time, for a long time, Iowa led five to three, and the the last. Five to three score was an Arizona win over Iowa in 1980. That's how ugly today's game was in Iowa City. Hey, Dub, you know as well as anyone, you you know those teams in Iowa and that region. Not that you don't know teams across the nation, but that we've talked Iowa football, Iowa offense the entire off season, and we just figured by it's, it's almost a statistical anomaly that they would have to be better than 123rd in the nation. There's just too many bad teams out there for them to be the right. seventh worst offense in the country. And then they go out against an FCS team. I didn't look at the final numbers. I remember looking at halftime because I'm like, it's three to three at halftime. That's all. They, <laughs> that's all they got was a field goal. And I looked at the halftime numbers. Uh, Petrus was six of 15 for 41 yards with a pick. And they had rushed for, 15 yards on 16 carries at halftime. And I was like, this is unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. Now, South Dakota State, the Jackrabbits, are a, are a sure. top four FCS. I mean, yeah. they're one of the better of the smaller schools. But still, you're Iowa. You're a Big Ten school. You're at home. South Dakota State should be bleeding from the ears at halftime. Yeah, there are other teams in FBS football that certainly wouldn't be able to put up that kind of defensive effort that Iowa did against them, but they would be able to score touchdowns. Like you put yeah. the Rutgers out there, Illinois, Kansas, they'd score 
touchdowns against uh, it's that's I, I don't have words for it. I didn't watch one play of it, uh, but I, I maybe maybe I'll put myself to sleep some night uh, by putting in the Iowa yeah highlights or whatever you want to call them. Wow. Well, it was pretty amazing. I was at the Iowa State game. Yep. And every time they announced the Iowa score, and it stayed like 3-3, three, 5-3, three, five, three, <laughs> seven three there was just laughter laughter the iowa state fans la- were laughing uh, we'll see if they're laughing next next saturday sure and the two meet in the two meet in iowa city but uh i mean you're a big 10 school playing the fcs and you can't find the end zone one time i i Wonder Corey, how- Corey, I, I all I all I can think of is, I wonder the next time we see Corey, is it going to be really obvious that he went for the just for men, or is he going to just leave the gray in, because he just had to be, he had to be dying, he had to be. Yeah, I texted him at one point when I saw the halftime score, and uh, yeah, I was like, "Are you serious?" Um. Where in the world was that? But anyway, and then I just had to tweet about it because I'm like, is this is this real? This is so their final numbers, you know, Petrus goes 11 of 25 for 109, throws a pick. And they rush for 57 yards on 36 carries. Um, and so I assume, J-Dub, did you see the final safety? Yes, I did. So I assume I saw it I saw I saw, I saw a highlight of the play. I assume okay. So it wasn't any kind of intentional deal. No, he was trying the the uh, SDSU quarterback was trying to roll to his right and he threw the ball as he was as he was falling to the ground. Oh. He was tackled from behind and and his knees did it was it was clear. And his knees did hit the end zone turf before he got the ball out of his hand. I got you. Uh, the first safety was uh, uh, nation's leading tackler Jack Campbell uh, stuffing the tailback right at the line of scrimmage. Uh, that was that was the uh, that was the first safety. We we talked in the past about Iowa's punter and yeah. how effective he is. I and once that. again today, I think there were four times he punted San Diego State inside their own ten. Yeah, that's uh, that's crazy. <laughs> it's a crazy score. Yeah, they yeah they held. Uh, Contrast that to 66, 66, 64, whatever the yeah. whatever it was at the North Carolina. Uh, uh, six. T- how do you give up six touchdowns in one quarter? How do you not score six points with your offense? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The defense scored four and the offense scored three. You can look at it that way. You can look at it as Appalachian State scored six touchdowns in a quarter against obviously a horrible defense, but it's it's North Carolina. They got athletes. So right. like when is Iowa how long's it gonna take for Iowa to score six touchdowns? Uh Mid October, the the offense I, to score six touchdowns. I saw I saw some local highlights here because I did not see the game. I, I saw some local highlights and they were very down on Spencer Petras, and mm-hmm. and and he just he just flat missed people that were running open. I mean, there's no other way to describe it. He just did not put the ball. On target, I mean, it was. I compared. I compared what I saw from him to what I saw from, like, say, Thursday night J.T. Daniels, who, uh, for West Virginia, who had you know fell victim to a you know a tip pick six. Yeah, but he, he was accurate all night. His his ball was right where the guy could catch it all night long. Uh, Petrus is just like I. He's like. Okay, this is like the grid in the area where the guy's supposed to be. 
So I'm just going to try to throw the ball there, and, and hopefully the receiver ends up in the same space. As, I mean, it doesn't it, – I don't understand. And all these quarterbacks that were in the transfer portal? I'm looking at a list right now. I mean, yeah. Iowa couldn't pick up somebody in the transfer portal yeah, better could. than Spencer Petras? I mean – I I don't I I <laughs> I I I I I'm gonna have to yeah. go look at the uh, post game comments to see how they in any such way explained what went on offensively. Well, uh, uh, absolutely amazing. Uh, <laughs> it was a that game would have been a real drag to sit through, and you know. When I think of the word drag, yes. I think of four letters. And also four letters is L-I-N-K. Da -da 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 -da, the Amazon link. Yes, that's right, kids. The Amazon link makes its buffer appearance on the bottom of the screen. It doesn't cost you a dime. It doesn't change your experience. It makes the whole world happy because it shifts just a tiny modicum of wealth from Jeff Bezos to our man, Mark. So the thumbs up, the Amazon link, it's it's your duty. It's your If you're here right now, if you're watching the voice of college football, it's your duty to use the Amazon link. That's all there is to it. I'm sure you got a lot of people piled up, Mark. I'll get out of the way. Thanks for all you do. And, hey, it, we've got football to talk about. Hooray! Thanks, J-Dub. We do have uh, quite a list uh, piling up here, so I'll say this. Uh, we're not going to have a big free-for-all like they do on that other show that I have on my channel, you know, when uh, the knuckleheads get together and we do, like, 12 people at the same time. So we're not doing that. But if you do have somebody that, uh, like, if you guys uh, jump in here and you're waiting with somebody else and you're like, oh, well, wouldn't mind uh, talking to so-and-so, then just, just let me know that, and I'll bring them into the chat as well. But we'll just uh, take them in order. We got Rocky Top Kane on the line. Hey, how's it going there, Mark? I'm doing well. What's going on, man? Uh, not a whole lot. Um, I just want to start off with that uh, I, my teams went 2-1 and one this weekend. Unfortunately, Army couldn't quite top off uh, Coastal Carolina. Uh -huh. um, but uh, other than that, ten uh, Tennessee had a great game on Thursday, and uh, Miami, of course, you know, it's against Bethune Cookman, granted. Um, but I definitely saw some some really good things in that game. Uh, for one, no draw passes. I mean, we <laughs> we we've been talking about all preseason, you know, all all during camp about uh, wide receivers dropping passes. We've had that in the off season. We've had it last season, the season before. Uh, Pope, uh, Wiggins, players like that who have just butterfingers, no draw passes. Um, Tyler Van Dyke, I think, went like thirteen of. I mean, I know he only missed like three passes. So it was like 13 of like 17. Um, Garcia came in, was perfect three for three. But uh, that was great to see. It was also great to see the run game get established, 238 total rushing yards uh, led by Parrish. And that's not that's, – uh, let's not forget that Knighton was not playing because he was still on the sideline due to injury. Um, Citizen is lost for the whole season, the true freshman. Um, a rough tackle, tackle uh, Zion Nelson – Probably won't play till like maybe week three or so. Um, plus, I think there was like a one or two wide receivers that were suspended. Just a lot of players missing on the offensive side. Um, so a lot of good things on the offense. On the defense, we could we definitely have you know big plays to clean up on. We gave up way too many big plays. I think I saw there was like a couple of them for like forty plus yards. Uh, the longest run was like a twenty something yard run. Um, so definitely need to clean up that uh, the, the tackling. Um, there's, there's definitely definitely things to work on, but from what we've seen from the first game, I, I think we saw some some good things uh, to get ready for Southern Miss, who they're, they might be a little exhausted. I just noticed where Southern Miss won uh, – no, sorry, lost their game to Liberty in four overtimes. Four overtimes, which um, looking at the overtime score, I, I guess they won by safety because they this, their overtime score showing is five to three. So, well, no, that's uh, that's the new rule as of was it last season or the season before? I think it was last season. So they play one overtime, then the second overtime they have to go for two, 
And then the third overtime, and people correct me if I'm wrong, I might be off by one overtime. The third overtime, they just run two point conversion plays. That's all. Oh, it is. okay. You just run a two point conversion play, then they run a two point. Con- so it's only one, it's a one play overtime. Oh, okay. So they, yes. They change that to speed it up. So yeah, they, they, that took them all the way. Um, so it'll be interesting to see, uh, you know, how Miami fares against Southern Miss next weekend. Um, who, of course, you know, Southern Miss has, uh, has, a, has, a, has a, I'm trying to remember, I think he has the son of our, one of our alumni, Frank Gore Jr., um, yep. at running back. So it'll be interesting to see how we can handle him, uh, hopefully better than we did, you know, some of the run game against uh, against Bethune-Cookman. But overall, like I said, you know, a lot of good things on offense. Definitely we're still for work on defense. Special teams. Love the special teams. Uh, Keyshawn Smith almost took one back to the house. I think he stepped out like on the 30, or like the 20, somewhere between the 20 and the 30-yard line. Um, but he all, he had like 168 yards, I think, or like average of like 60 yards of return. And that's something we haven't seen in years. <laughs> um, and the only down, well, well I'll, I'll say it's a downside. It's, uh, unfortunately, uh, Headley didn't get any, any game time at all because we'd have to punt. So he's got to hope maybe he'll have a chance to warm up next game. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the overall, just a, you know, good game, you know, um, out of them, uh, good game at Thursday out of Tennessee, even though they were playing Ball State. Um, so just good, good signs, at least for good first games for both of them. Uh, real quick here, um, Rocky Top game. I'm guessing you're an Army fan because uh, you were either in the service or somebody in your family. Um, yeah, I served from 2000 to 2004. Well, thank you for doing that. Uh, thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. It, yeah. Um, and of course, their their big game is always every year Air Force and Navy. So those, sure. if all we can win those two, take the Presidential Cup. Um, I would like to see Army play. You know, win more games, obviously, on top of those. But uh, as long as they win those two, <laughs> uh, Tennessee and Miami. How are you a fan of both at the same time? Um, well, Miami. I'm I'm born and raised in Jacksonville, Florida. Been a Hurricane fan since about like the late uh, '90s. Um, but Tennessee, uh, we just me and the family just moved up to Tennessee about three years ago. Uh, we live not too far outside the Knoxville area, so uh, you know, I, as much as I am a huge Hurricane fan, I don't really see us going down to Miami almost hardly at all, uh, simply due to the cost. And Tennessee, the, the uh, Nayland James Stadium or Nayland Stadium is about like under an hour away from us, so we'll probably end up going to more a lot more of their games, you know, unfortunately than than okay. can go to Miami games. All right. I was just curious. Anything I figured, else? You know, we're, we're here, so might as well. <laughs> sure. That's not how I approach life, but we're all different. That's not a big deal. I was just curious because I could move anywhere and I'm still going to like the teams that I like. I could, it, it, I've lived all over the, I haven't lived all over the place. I've lived about four different places and uh, I'm still just going to root for the teams that I root for. But a lot of people then they move somewhere and they become yeah. fans of and, the teams there. And- my sons, my, I, I plan on taking my sons to a lot of games, so they may end up being Tennessee fans. Um, I, I Growing up, you know, like I said, I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida, so we were, what, six hours away from Miami, um, about two, three hours away from Gangsville and, and, and Tallahassee, so we didn't go to really any college football games growing up as a kid, and I, that's something I definitely want to have for my sons to take them to watch football in person, and, well, we're nearby, ten, nearby Knoxville, so sure. it'll be Tennessee games. Okay, Rocky Top. Uh, anything else? Um, no, just a good game between Utah and, and Florida. Um, I mean, all the way down to the wire, obviously, with that last pass, but good game. Uh, fortunately, I did miss the uh, Ohio State game because I was watching the Florida game on my phone, but good game there. Um, but yeah, just looking forward to the rest of the season, and uh, hopefully uh, all three of those teams do well again next weekend. Okay. I appreciate you calling. Call back anytime. I will do. You have a good night. All right. We better keep it moving here. We got reasonable gump on the line. And uh, Bama, of course, was able to beat the spread tonight, even though I had a few people in my life say, my goodness, they're giving Utah State no respect, a 42-point favorite. And I said, uh, yeah, they'll probably crush that line, even though I took Utah State in 42 points, but that's a whole other deal. Reasonable gump. Well, actually, Mark, it's uh, the reasonable gump. I, just, oh, sorry. I changed it because, you know, 
we are identifying with the word the in front of our names these days. So are we really? Yeah, ap apparently. We can well, even trademark it too. <laughs> well, that, that that is the Ohio State University, which they came up with that uh, thought a long, long time ago. Not according to Kirk Herbstreit. He said when he played there, no one said that. And he thinks it was arrogant and stupid when people started to use it. Well, I don't think it's arrogant or stupid, nor do I like proclaim it to be the greatest thing in the world that it has to be done. I, it makes no difference to me whatsoever. But um, I think it's kind of humorous that it's arrogant and stupid in the eyes of many people because it's just something that I think... I think... There's obviously, when it comes to Alabama, Ohio State, and maybe some others, a larger portion of the fan base that are arrogant, not because they're arrogant people themselves, just because they can take more pride in being arrogant for their football program because they win all the time. And that's probably the same. I believe it is the same for Ohio State fans. But that the Ohio State University, that, that's been going around for a a good if it wasn't kirk herb street's day it wasn't long after well i would know nothing about it i'll take your word for it i just thought the entire story was pretty uh pretty humorous and uncle lou made a pretty funny video on it <laughs> but anyway man so uh gathered by the nature of the questions you asked the last caller you're you were reading the stream yard chat so i won't get into more in, into that but anyway, so I'm going to have to agree with you, though, on Ohio State. I thought that the biggest thing about that game was the fact that Notre Dame couldn't move the ball on them. I, I think any Ohio State fan should be happy to see that. I mean, everyone knows the offense will eventually get there. I mean, they didn't throw it all over the place on Oregon, and they ended up losing that game. At least you guys came away with a pretty comfortable win, you know, this time. So yeah, uh, I thought Ohio State came away looking pretty good on, but good, good tonight. Yeah, I took more positives away from it being that kind of game and then being able to play that kind of game. And even though, uh, again, once they proved themselves to be the better team, and that wasn't in the first half, but once we got into the third quarter for the entirety of the second half, even though they didn't score a million points, they were clearly the better team and in control of the game and pushing Notre Dame all over the field. I thought, you know what? This is better. This is a better result, a better proving ground than if they would have showed up like they did against a few good teams last year, like Michigan State and Purdue, and scored 56 or 59 points and thrown it all night to a bunch of wide open receivers. And their defense would have never been challenged because the offense was scoring so many points and they were up 21 nothing before you blink. So the defense mm -hmm. really could just, you know, we give up 20, 24, 28. It doesn't matter. Um, no, I, I thought that this was more meaningful. Maybe not more impressive, but more meaningful. Well, shifting down to Alabama for one second, you know, the only thing you can really hope for when you play a game like this is that, well, two things you hope for. A, you blow them out, which we did. And B, it's hard to shut teams out. I mean, anyone. You play you play these lower-level teams like Mercer, Austin P, Tennessee, you know, all, all these type of teams. It's still hard cool. to blow Mercer, anyone Austin out. Mercer, Austin P, Tennessee. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I was happy to see that. And, yes, take that with a tongue-in-cheek, Mark. You know I'm going to make a Tennessee joke every time I'm on here. <laughs> but, but, yeah, that was pretty cool. Um, I'm excited to see if our defense can main maintain this. The game that, that, that I was watching for pretty much most of the primetime hour was Florida and Utah. That mm -hmm. was a great game. Yeah. And – I don't know. I still kind of, I kind of came away feeling like eh, Utah kind of rubbed off on me as a little bit better of a team, but not really, not much. It wasn't like overly better. I, I would say the home field advantage for, probably might have tipped it over to Florida's favor, uh, you know, for, for the Florida to get the win tonight. But I mean, hell, uh, <laughs> Utah was doing really, really good all up until that 
sort of boneheaded throw, as you pointed out, or the announcers said he was trying to throw it to the tight end, and I watched the replay. I'm like, the tight end was on his ass. And there were two defenders around him, one right next to him and the other one who yeah. intercepted it. So I, it didn't look like he was throwing it at the ground either. There were plenty of other safer spots to throw it at the ground. So I, that just looked like a boneheaded decision to happen at the worst possible time. Yeah, it sure was, especially since it wasn't like it was fourth down or anything like that. Obviously, it was fourth down. They would have kicked the, the, the field goal, but under different circumstances. So they had plenty of time. There wasn't like three seconds left in the game. There was plenty of time, plenty of downs. And he, I, I assume he didn't see one of those two. He couldn't have missed both of those players and just felt like the tight end was going to make uh, a one-on-one -on -one play against that. I just think in that situation when it just takes a field goal to tie the game, go to overtime, you obviously you play much more conservative and you not in terms of play calling, but in terms of throwing to wide open receivers, not trying to fit it into a wasn't even a tight window. There was no window there. There was nothing. No, there was a guy blocked by two guys wearing blue jerseys. Yeah, I, I can't explain it other than he didn't see. And again, I can't believe he didn't see either one of them i can believe he didn't see one of them i do think utah got a little bit of help with it was really strange to me that they got another time out there did you notice that because they went into that that last series having already used one before florida scored and then they used two kind of immediately and then they got to call another one after the quarterback you know had his big run and the, and the guys are like wait i thought they all, I, th I thought they were out of timeouts and then someone said that they were awarded one prior because the guy had lost his helmet i'm like i mean i, I guess maybe i don't understand the rules as, as good or something but because a player losing a helmet i've never seen that causing both teams to go get to huddle around their coach for a, a 30 seconds or a whole minute which is exactly what happened when they called those timeouts so uh I don't that this it that that seemed almost kind of like a fifth down type situation there that everyone kind of, sort of missed. Well, I was uh, watching both Ohio State and Notre Dame and Florida Utah, but I had the sound on the Ohio State game. So once that started, that was I, I was watching every play, but uh, I didn't keep track of it. I didn't have the sound up. It was, it was just kind of strange. All right, so just let, let last two games, going to take a shot at here. Uh, one, here's a little trivia question for you. How many ways are there to score seven points without scoring a touchdown? One. Eight. What? Wait a minute. Oh. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You're forgetting about one-point safeties. One-point safeties? Yeah, that's a thing. Do, don't you remember a few years ago when Oregon got that? No. Against like Utah State or something? No, it was against uh, TCU. Oh, when no, that's not even the case. How do you score one point? Because even if you enter, even if you, um, even if you, even if they go for a two point conversion and you, I can explain it to you. Okay, go ahead. So on an extra point, yes. If for whatever reason it flubs or whatever, and they got to pick it up and try and run it or something, and they fumble it into the end zone. And the other team picks it up and tries to run it out, and then they get tackled into. I'm sorry. If the other team picks the ball up, runs back into their own end zone, and then gets tackled in the end zone, so they picked it up in the field of play, then went yeah. backwards into their own end zone. They had now established possession and went into their own end zone and got tackled inside. That is a one point safety because it was on an extra point. So again, if I was the team that's going to be scoring these seven points in a really weird way then you're talking about if the other team, South Dakota State, scored mm. and they're going for an extra point. Right. A conventional extra point? Yes. And, the, like, they fumble the snap. Sure. And it somehow gets kicked into the end zone or something. It would have to get – you would have to pick it up. You're the team trying to score yes. a one point. You have to yeah. pick it up on, like, the one-yard line – run backwards trying to get around a player or something. Yeah. You run backwards into your own end zone and then you trip and fall or you, you get tackled. 
That's a one run backwards 99 yards. No, right, right into your own end zone. You're trying to defend the extra kick, right? So you, the, the end zone. Oh, to your the back. defense gets the yes. fumble. Yes. Gotcha. And then you fumble back into your own end zone and you recover. No, the defense gets the fumble and then tries to run backwards to get around somebody and yes. then gets tackled back there. In its own you don't actually zone. have to run very far. There actually is another way to do it with what you just sort of guessed at, which is doing the 99-yard thing, but it's never happened because you had to basically fumble it back 99 yards. Yeah. Do you remember the play Mississippi State? I, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. yeah, you can look it up right now. Just type in Oregon one-point one safety. It'll do it for you. Um, I shouldn't even bring up this Mississippi State scenario because I don't remember what it was now. There was a fumble. I know what it was. Is uh, they had like third and goal at at whoever they were playing at, at the uh, the opponent's you know eight yard line or whatever, and they actually fumbled and the ball got like knocked down the field. Oh yeah, you're talking about it. using an attack or something. Yeah, or it and ended up being like, third and ninety four. <laughs> yeah, it was like yeah, it was exactly. It was like third and ninety something. Yeah. <laughs> One point safety. A one point safety is when a team trying a two point conversion or PAT turns the ball over. The defense takes the ball out of the end zone, then gets tackled in the end zone for a safety. Right. Which which makes sense because the play was for one point. The play was for one point. Yes. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> learn learn something new every day, don't you? So when you say eight times, there are various. I mean, I'm just uh, I'm smashed. doing like I'm, I'm I'm adding all the one variations of seven. Yeah, there's other. Two. So two field be... goals, a one point safety, a field goal, and two sure. safeties. Safeties and one point yeah. safeties, yeah. Right. But anyway, see so, yeah. <laughs> the the face you made when you were trying to like repeat what your reaction was when you saw the score was like three to three at halftime it was pretty funny yeah yes yeah, that face right there <laughs> i hate twitter but at the same time that that's my that's my place to call people out and that sort of thing which of course i've got this i could do it here i should have went on produced a video and just talked about how awful i was offenses maybe i'll do that tomorrow yeah, um, yeah, I'd watch it. But I just, you know, try to try to put it in some kind of perspective. I'll look up a few things to try to put it in some kind of perspective of how what a pathetic performance this was. Especially, you know, even if they played, well, we'll take Georgia and Alabama out of the mix because we could see them doing that against. But if they're playing it, if they were playing Penn State and did that, we'd all be going, man, their offense is terrible. They only scored a field goal against Penn mm -hmm. State. They were playing South Dakota State. <laughs> it's unbelievable. It's just unfathomable. So yeah, I couldn't wait to get to Twitter just to tell everybody that would look at my tweet how horrible Iowa is. I'm like, we all thought that it was impossible for their offense to get any worse. Well, yeah. I got to go look up this Twitter of yours. It sounds <laughs> pretty entertaining. Well, no, it's not very entertaining. I don't necessarily... I would like people to follow me on Twitter just so I've got a lot of people on Twitter following me because people get impressed by that, but they shouldn't be. It's like being on here and uh, people pay more attention to you when you got 37,000 subscribers rather than when you got 300. But I was the same guy and knew just as much about college football. So that's that's the only reason. All right. Last thing, Mark. Yes. We've got a long list of people, but the last game. I know you watched this game. I watched it too, primarily because it was the only one on. That was yeah. really bad of them not to schedule a good game at 11 o'clock, but whatever. And when I say good, I mean, you know, big, big name brands. This was, yeah. these were actually great games, the North Carolina State games. But I watched NC State versus the uh, East Carolina. Yeah. I enjoyed that. I did. And, but the end of that, look, I got to call out the uh, the coaching or the play calling or whoever made the decision to do this. I really cannot stand it when coaches are, when, you know, 
they got the ball back and they have limited time, right? It's like a minute and a half or something. Yes. And they got to go down there. They got to score to win. But because they only need a field goal, they just sort of play to try and get their field goal kicker in a 40 ish yard yeah. range. And I, I hate that. Why? A 40 yard field goal in college, no less, is not a high accuracy play. Don't put all that pressure on the guy who just missed an extra point. No yes, less. exactly. He's got sticky legs. Exactly, Get exactly, exactly. Touchdown. Get down there and score the touchdown, or at least, at the very least, make it a comfortable kick for him. I couldn't agree more. I, I looked it up even because I produced a video on that. He went one for three from 40 to 49 yards last year. And he, like you say, he just missed an extra point. So why are you putting the weight of the world on him? You have this quarterback. I love their quarterback, Taylors. He's a veteran guy, and he's he's composed. I mean, I know some people may be saying, well, maybe that's just as far as they could get. No, 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 no. You watch the game. Yes. They immediately got down into that 40-yard range, and then they just started running up the middle. They tried these wacky – this wacky throw over here that wouldn't have gotten anything. <laughs> and then they actually, I think he took a loss. So he had to run another 10 yards to try and make up that just to get him back into a 42 yard range. I mean, it, 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 it was very clear that they were trying to get there, run the rest of the clock out and kick a walk off field goal. It's like, even if you're going to do that, make it an easy field goal. at yes. least. Yes. Uh, the reasonable gump. This is my favorite story when it comes to, that type of buffoonery uh herm edwards and this is in the nfl but herm edwards you can love him for certain reasons but he is not a tactician from a football standpoint he he knows more about football than i ever will but from a game management standpoint no he's coaching for the jets and the week prior they're playing in the nfl playoffs at san diego he did exactly what you're talking about and um he missed a field goal that kept the score tied, but he lucked out because the other team had a field goal kicker, Nate Kading, who never missed a field goal, but missed a field goal. And Herm Edwards' team, the Jets, then won the game with a field goal. So here we are the next week, and he's got – so they're playing the Steelers. They're a heavy underdog. It's like 21 degrees in Pittsburgh. The winds are howling. You know, it is not the type of, you know, it's spitting rain, snow. It's not the type of field conditions you want to be kicking the football. Uh, They're losing by a field goal. They get the football like at their own 20. They throw a graphic up that says Curtis Martin, their best running back, has the longest streak in the NFL of not fumbling. So he's got the most reliable ball carrier. Chad Pennington they throw up another graphic has never thrown a red zone interception in his career. <laughs> and they're marching down the field. Like it's nothing They're You know, everything's 12 yards, 14 yards. Boom. They're moving down the field. Da, 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 da. They get just barely inside the 50 yard line. And all of a sudden they shut it down because he would rather trust a kicker trying to kick through like 30 mile an hour winds in 20 degree weather than trust a quarterback that doesn't throw interceptions and a running back who never fumbles and they're moving the ball at will. And I'm thinking, did you not learn from what happened last week? You lucked out last week. (laughs) You did the same thing last week, but you got lucky. But what's he do? He clamps down. They've got to kick like a 49 yard field goal. They miss it. They lose the playoff game. You know, the season's over. And I'm like, this is exactly what's wrong with some of these coaches. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's bad. It's terrible. <laughs> if it does work out, they're lucky. And honestly, I mean, if for nothing else, you shouldn't be putting that kind of pressure on one player, you know, the kicker. I know the quarterback has to deal with that every single play, but I mean, come on. The quarterback's also playing every single play. The kicker walks out there after yeah. having to watch the game go on. Hey, you know, his anxiety going up and down. Oh my God, can they get me a little closer? Oh my God, is this whole game going to come down to me? And he has to go out there for one play and be perfect, and it's just it's just dumb. At least try to get make it easy as possible for the kid if you're that damn set on kicking a field goal. Anyway, all right, Mark. Thank go you, ahead. sir. 
I'm going to get on out of here. Hey, uh, real, real quick, Alaska uh, has an Army guy. Of course, you know I'm an Air Force guy. At least we still know how to play football right in this year. The only service that got me to win today. So go Falcons. Okay. And we'll be taking that Commander in Chief's tr- uh, cup at the end of the year. Yeah, it looks like it. All right, man. Have a good night. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. All right. Uh, yeah, that drives me nuts. It's almost like an. Going to take this call from Jeffrey here in two seconds. I'm not a basketball guy, but I watched it and covered it professionally for a long time. So I, I do know the sport, but I'm no expert by any stretch. But I don't watch it now. But yeah, I covered it just like I covered every other sport as a sportscaster. But what drives me nuts in basketball is how many times does a team need a field goal at the end of the game? They need a basket. And the point guard that, you know, it's the clock's ticking, you know, 16, 15, 14. They always, almost always wait too long to start the play. <laughs> they wait until there's like five seconds. They need to start running the play at like 10 seconds. They always wait. They always wait too long. Then they always settle for a jumper. They, some kind of like fade away, just off balance, like heave to the basket when you take the ball to the rim, it's a higher percentage shot. They're going to foul you. You're going to force the official to make a call. I, I that's always That always gets screwed up, too, almost all the time. Jeffrey, how you doing tonight? I'm doing good, but, man, I'm tired. You're tired? <laughs> uh, I was going to ask. I was going to ask you about last night's game. Uh, since Indiana beat oh, Illinois. That's beautiful. Yes. Uh, do you think that that Indiana can make a bowl game now, or is it still? I'm mean, obviously. I mean, it's hard to answer that, but well, sure that they helps. can. Well, uh, mm-hmm. see, we figured it out the other night with you that it was going to be tough for them to make a bowl game, but now they've got a win in the Big Ten, yeah. and they yeah. need to go three and six in the Big Ten. Because mm-hmm. who's their toughest non-conference? Oh, they got Cincinnati. That's right. Mm-hmm. That Cincinnati team. Yeah, it's funny good. because in the uh, in the chat the other night, I was uh, everybody was going Illinois, and I was like Indiana by three, and Indiana did end up winning by three. Yeah. It was crazy. They couldn't score at all the whole second half, and then the the last drive, they just yeah. they just go down game. the field and score a touchdown. They couldn't even run, and then they run it, and it was crazy. I was going nuts in the deck. This is like Indiana couldn't even win a Big Ten game last year, and they won. Another game I thought was interesting, too. I mean, just because I, I was having fun in the chat the other night, but some guy, I'm not going to say his name, but some guy was like uh, that BYU has not won in the state of Florida since the 1970s or something like that, and that South Florida was going to win because Gary Bohannon uh, transferred. And I'm like, BYU is going to blow out South Florida. Absolutely. And BYU blew out South Florida. <laughs> they were 1-11 last year. Gary Bohannon can't fix that. No, he can't fix that. And yeah, there's no comparison between the two teams. And when I saw the point spread was like 11 and a half, it made me want to bet on football games again, because I was like, are you kidding me? 11 and a half points? Mm-hmm. Where did they get this point spread? <laughs> Didn't yeah, they win by I like 35? I, I don't bet, oh, I don't bet either. My my uh, mom like, gets to. mad every time I say I want to bet, but that, that'd be definitely a game I would have picked BYU yeah. over, man. That, uh, the uh, 11 and a half, that's insane. Uh, South Florida was terrible. And uh, another thing, too, um, Utah, Florida, again, in the chat, everybody was saying Utah was going to win. And then you had on college game day, Utah is going to make the college football playoff. I'm like, they're not going to go in and win at Florida. I said it's going to be a tight game, but I think Florida's crowd is going to win. And the crowd got to Utah right at the end. That was a great game, though. I mean, it could have gone either way, but that was insane. Yeah, it was. It was a great game. And we'll see how good Florida is. I, I think I got a pretty good gauge on how good Florida is. I think they're a, they're a really good team. They've got to play an SEC schedule. I have no question that they're one of the 25 best teams in the country. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean they're going to finish in the top 25, but they have top 25, well, better than that talent. Well, see, the that's I'll the see problem right there. Sure. That's yep. the problem right there when you just said about, you know, top 25 talent, but they might not finish in the top 25. I think that's where a lot of perception gets wrong because Utah was ranked seventh. And I'm not saying Utah's not good because they're a great team, 
but Utah was only ranked that high because of where they finished last year. And Florida's talent is still maybe better than Utah's, even though they weren't ranked and they were six and seven last year. That's where the perception gets off with a lot of people that don't follow the sport as closely as you do, or even maybe me because of the fact that they just see they're not ranked. Oh, Utah's going to win. I'm like, that's not how it works. Pac-12 is way worse than the SEC, even yeah. though Utah is probably sure. the best team in the conference. Yeah. I practically flipped a coin to pick that game. I was back mm-hmm. and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, Who did you end up picking? I know that you, I you couldn't picked Utah. do the, the other night. But, I picked Utah. Mm, I picked Florida. Pick well, good for you. It was, uh, But, but mm-hmm. Utah, see, see, that's one of those games when – Obviously, the results, all that matters is, you know, a team Mm -hmm. won, a team lost. But if you're evaluating teams like we do here, I come away from that thinking, who's the better team? Well, I don't know. (laughs) Uh, Utah Mm -hmm. won the game or Florida won the game fair and square. But, of course, they were playing in the swamp. It's a Mm -hmm. a pretty nice advantage playing in the swamp. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the game could have gone either way. It went down to the wire. Uh, if well, yeah, the, I agree with that. If, if it was at Utah, I would have picked them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, what I'm curious about, Jeffrey, uh, being an Indiana fan, we don't have many Indiana fans here watching. I don't believe so. It doesn't seem mm-hmm. like it. Uh, can you bring some other Indiana fans in? I love <laughs> fan bases that aren't Ohio State, Clemson, Alabama. Mm-hmm. We, we have plenty of those people. I love when I mm. hear somebody's an Oregon State fan, an Indiana fan, a Vandy fan that watches us. So if you have any other Indiana fans, you should bring them in here. Well, it's kind of funny that you say that because, uh, you know, I, when I, I, I've been watching Alabama. The first time I ever called you earlier this year, I told you that uh, my dad is an Alabama fan, but I was an Indiana fan. And I've been watching Alabama since I was a kid, and I like Alabama a lot. But they win all the time, and to me, it's almost boring. You know what I'm saying? At least with uh, – I root for IU as well because they aren't very good, and at least when they win, you see the celebration. and You see, like, uh, when they beat Illinois, you just see Tom Allen and you see the players just act like they won the Super Bowl. When Alabama wins a game over a top-10 team, it's like, who cares? I mean, they literally destroyed the trophy – uh, in 2017 when they lost to Clemson in the championship game, and that's my problem. Mm-hmm. That's why, I mean, I'm still an Alabama fan to an extent, but I just don't like how over cocky they are, the fans of the school, and even my dad a little bit, but, I mean, I love them. But it's like it's like if they don't beat a team by over the spread, like if they beat Utah State 41-0, it's like, oh, they didn't cover. It's like, who cares? They blew them out and put their foot off the gas, but they won 55-0. Yeah. I mean, it's just kind of boring to me and watching a team that doesn't win a lot and and when they win, it's just their celebrations ecstatic. It just makes me enjoy it a lot more. And unfortunately, I don't know anybody personally that's an Indiana fan because everybody makes fun of me for it. So I just say I like Alabama too as well. It's just kind of <laughs> like it's kind of a joke. Yeah, see that Indiana Illinois game. I you have to be a fan of either team to get into that game because nobody here that's on this chat cares about that game. But we had that game on. I was on while the game was on and, you know, I recorded that game. I wanted to, to dissect it, watch it. I, I love games like that. I just love the less than elite games. I I don't know why I'm just more intrigued by them. I guess because all I hear all week is everybody wanting to talk about Ohio state, Notre Dame and Georgia and Oregon. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's just the same crowd every time. And like I said, I love watching the big games like like you and everybody else, but the, the under-the-radar games just do it for me. I mean, I watch so many games that are not ranked. My dad's like, turn the channel back to the Utah Florida game. Well, I'm watching this game. I'm watching the, the not-ranked team. It's like, man, it's funny. It's like, yeah. you, you wish I had two TVs. <laughs> yeah, I tend to do mm-hmm. that too. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Well, Jeffrey, anything else? Uh, I probably got to go to bed. You know, my mom's probably <laughs> like, man, you're going to be too tired for church. So I got to go That's probably, right. but I'll, I'll definitely yeah. call in soon. I, ha- I had to talk about that Indiana game though, man. It was Absolutely. great. But uh, thanks be, for having me on. Be refreshed for church. So you, 
you know, can take in the sermon and apply it. Definitely. All right, Jeffrey, have a good one. What I've got posted here are my predictions on Patreon. Let's see how we did here. Uh, West Virginia plus uh, one and oh, one and one, two and one against the spread, three and one, four and one, four and two, four and three, five and three. Ah, shoot, Oklahoma State, those morons, they were up by 36. They didn't cover, though. Five and four. Mississippi State's up big right now. They should cover 15 and a half, right? I think. I think I'm on my way to a win there. Six and four. Six and five. Seven and five. Eight and five. Eight and six. Nine and six. Nine and seven. Ten and seven. Eleven and seven. If Oregon State can keep this up, I'll be 12 and 7. 12 and 7. We'll take it. That's what, about 63%, 65%. A Yako. I uh, apologize profusely if I mispronounce that. Uh, a Yako says, uh, who was in charge of putting USF at plus 12? And did it really receive equal action to stay there? How? I say the same thing. Worst spread of the week. I regret not betting more on it all right let's go to our next call we've got uh chris on the line chris how you doing good good yeah what's going on tonight oh i'm sorry i could not know if you could hear me <laughs> well i don't know i just uh just want to ha hear your thoughts i guess on a couple teams maybe uh i don't know if you caught did you catch the vanderbilt hawaii game at all did you happen to catch that game i I actually found it online, and I I had it on. I I can't say that I really analyzed it, but uh, uh -huh. well, that, that quarterback ran for like there was yeah. a hundred yard run, uh, right? Which, yes. That was I don't know. I guess uh, uh, what I was trying to tell you, I guess, was uh, it looks like there's going to be uh, from at least from what I can tell, and I don't follow it really that closely, so I, I'm just it's just kind of my own opinion, but. Um, I'm thinking there's going to be several teams maybe from the SEC that might maybe for once. And I, you know, it's, I know it's early in the, you know, it's really way too early to even guess, but maybe for once there'll be a couple teams maybe that might, you know, pose a challenge to not that there's anything wrong with having uh, Georgia and Alabama in the SEC championship or anything, but, you know, I think, uh, one of the things I think that might help, I guess, is if some of those SEC teams like Florida or Tennessee, even Tennessee looked okay. You know, uh, that's what we really need, I think, are better. Uh, I guess it's throughout the, the SEC. And also, uh, I don't know how the other conferences compare against the SEC, but if we could get better uh, parity, I guess, within the SEC, don't you think that might make a difference in terms of uh, getting maybe a better uh, championship game at the end of the year? Uh, yes, although when you think about it, the SEC is just better than the other conferences at the top. Mm -hmm and top to bottom, but there's, there's no parity in some of the other conferences as well. There is no parity. Yeah. Well, oh. well, when you compare the Alabama and now Georgia stranglehold on the sec, isn't that similar to Oklahoma winning the big 12 almost every year, Ohio state winning the big 10 almost every year, Clemson winning the ACC almost every year. Oh yeah. I, I guess I, I wouldn't necessarily disagree. I just, uh, I did notice last year though, I don't know. That you probably don't like it when I bring up old games, but you know there were. I think I nine, love it when you bring up old games. Well, I don't, I don't really, think people like it when we're talking about the current season, since we've got like eight months to talk about old games. Well, no, I guess all I'm saying is uh, I think Clemson, as good as they were, still, you know, I think uh, was it Pittsburgh? I think that won the conference last year. Yes. But well, I mean uh, that that's demonstrate. I mean that, that demonstrates, I guess, uh, what uh, that there's at least a little bit more uh, competition, I guess. And uh, what I'd like to see, I don't know. I don't know if it'll happen, I guess, because Clemson's pretty good. But uh, so I don't expect that they're going to stay, you know, they're going to be right up there at the top again, I'm thinking. But, but you know, uh, I guess I, what I want to see is just more teams that, that meet the, the same degree that Clemson already, you know, I know that's asking a lot. I don't know how Clemson got up to where they are so good, to be honest with you. I mean, Dabo Swinney must, he must know how to bring in the best players, but um what I want to see though, I guess is like more teams that can, I guess at the very least may, maybe at least make a challenge. And that's kind of what I was hoping might happen. I really don't think it's going to happen though, to be honest with you. I think, I, I think it'll probably be Alabama again. I, they look like they're pretty good again. And so 
I don't think it's going to be like it's going to be like another team that's going to necessarily uh, over overthrow them. But but I was kind of encouraged, I guess, just to see that there's other teams besides just Alabama that might pose a challenge, you know. And I don't know that it's going to change anything at all. But um, that's what I was hoping for, though, was to see like a greater uh, percentage of teams that might make a make a run. So you're talking about in the SEC, other teams besides Alabama and Georgia. So you're encouraged by, I'm guessing, Florida. Uh huh. And who else? Who well, else? Showed us well, I said Vanderbilt, but you know, I guess the reason I, I mentioned Vanderbilt, you know, I think as much as you know, people don't really give Hawaii a lot of credit. I think anytime you can go into Hawaii and beat them, I mean, and they beat them pretty good. You know, I think that that says something about where the program is at the at the at, the, at this point in time. I'm not saying that Vanderbilt's going to do a whole, they're probably not going to do a whole lot in the conference, but you know, I, uh, I, I have a, I have a, just from what I remember is growing up. Cause I remember Hawaii, you know, you, you didn't, you don't just go in there and beat them. I mean, you have to, you have to kind of be pretty good. I think even Alabama had difficulty beating them one year. So it's like, you don't just walk into, you know, Honolulu and beat roll run over Hawaii. I mean, so I think the way that Vanderbilt kind of rolled over Hawaii, I think that that speaks well for Vanderbilt. Um, well, the the only thing I would say about that, Chris, is you certainly, based on history, you're, you're right on the mark in regards to, yes, a, a lot of teams have gone to Hawaii. Shoot, I can think of a lot of Power 5 teams that have gone to Hawaii and lost or barely made it out of there with a win uh, historically. However, this particular Hawaii team had a lot of issues with the coach there, uh, the former coach, Todd Graham, and had a ton of defections, so their level of play dropped off considerably. Mm-hmm. Well, I didn't expect that they'd, re, you know, I, I kind of knew that they'd lost, but they weren't, I don't know that they were that great with Graham either. Were they, I mean, weren't they yeah. kind of 500 team? Yeah. I mean, they, weren't, they weren't terrible, but they weren't, I don't know that they were really doing much to make people really notice them. Were they, I mean, they, they were kind of mid, seven and seven or whatever yeah. it was, seven and yeah. six. Or, um, the other thing I guess I was going to ask you and, we already kind of talked about it, but, uh, you know, I was, I was kind of disappointed a little bit. Um, you know, I didn't expect that Oregon would necessarily go in and, you know, I didn't know, to be honest with you, I thought with the new coach, I thought they might actually pose a challenge to, so I was a little, I guess I, I don't want to say disappointed, but the way they got, I guess, steamrolled by, uh, by Georgia, that wasn't really encouraging because, you know, I, I don't know if that speaks ill of the conference or it maybe just speaks, I don't think you can really, I don't really think it's fair to pin like a lot, like you say, like with Utah or you, I don't think you can pin that on the conference. I think I, you have to kind of pin that on the program. I think, don't you think rather than like, Oh, that's a statement win for the, like uh, Florida beating Utah. That's like a statement win for the SEC. Well, I, I guess it is, but I think it's a lot of pressure to put on one team to have to for the, carry the whole conference on its back. I mean, I don't know. That's a lot of pressure in Utah. Actually. Uh, I only saw the end of it, to be honest with you. I didn't catch most of it, but, you know, that quarterback, he almost ran. I mean, he ran out of bounds, I think, but, you know, maybe he almost ran for a touchdown at the end. I mean, he came real close. Maybe if he had uh, maybe tried a different, you know, angle. I mean, they didn't look like they were going to stop him. I mean, he ran out. It got to at least, I think it was 20-yard run or far, farther. But And then, of course, he's the one that threw the interception. But And I don't know. I don't know what initiated that either. But, you know, I don't know why, you know, he felt like he had to throw it. But but, you know, Utah came pretty close, I think, to actually winning the game. I, I don't know that we should really give a huge amount of credit. I mean, yeah, definitely give the credit for the win to the Gators. But, you know, that quarterback himself almost won the game. I think we have to kind of maybe at least give him a little bit of credit for making it close. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Well, sure. Um, I said earlier that, of course, they played a game and the result was fair. Therefore, the result is all that matters and that, is a win for Florida and a loss for Utah. But in terms of evaluating the two teams, um, Gainesville is a difficult place to play. At Florida is a difficult place to play. So to to say that Florida is any better than Utah, I don't think we can really say that. These teams are extremely comparable. They could play 10 times and split five and five. And certainly Uh, We would expect for Utah to have a huge advantage at home if they played Florida at home versus having to play uh, in Gainesville. So, but all that matters is that they played one game and Florida won the game. So in terms of the result, the result is only one win and one loss. But I think any reasonable person watching that game 
comes away from it thinking that those teams are practically evenly matched. Um, my impression, and like I said, uh, you obviously know a lot more than I ever will about football in general, but, you know, it looked to me like Utah, you know, I, I don't know enough about the game to really make really good insightful comments about it, Mark, but, you know, it just looked to me like they had, they had a, I don't want to say they had it in their pocket, but you know, what was it? Maybe 20 seconds left. They didn't have a whole lot of time. And I don't think it was like, it was either second down or third down. I can't remember, but I don't know. You know, I really don't know what the right strategy would have been at that point. I, I know they threw the interception. I understand that, but would it, you know, would it have been better to like, what do you think? Like, I mean, maybe the fact he had to throw it was probably a bad thing, but you know, where is it the strategy comes into it? Or is it maybe that he should have done a rollout? And then I guess maybe if he can't throw it, then, I mean, I don't know. I, I guess that's where I have difficulty understanding what good proper game strategy is at that point. They were, you know, they were almost out of time really. So, I mean, I kind of wonder if it wasn't the right thing to do. It's just that he threw it to the wrong place. Well, um, I think a few things come into play there. Number one would be how many timeouts did they have? I uh -huh. don't believe they had any. I'm not sure. Uh, so if you don't have any timeouts and you're outside, let's say the two or three yard line, and there was what, about 25 seconds left, then you probably can't run the ball. You can't no. call a running play. No, so that's out the door. No. Uh, number two, you've got a mobile quarterback. So, you know, there are some options to flush him out of the pocket and roll him out. So he's, uh, a running threat. Uh, but you can always, again, wasn't there about 25 seconds left when they ran that play? About, yeah. So you could run the ball. It's You're killing plays if you do that, but you could. So if you let, if you design a play for him to roll out and give him a run pass option and he sees a huge lane to run and score the touchdown, then you leave it up to him. And even if he doesn't, you can get up and you can spike the ball. Uh -huh. um, and if you do that on first down, then you've killed another down and you're, you're at third down and you've stopped the clock. Well, like I said, you know, I, I don't know the first thing about coaching and I don't even know that what he did was the wrong thing. I think it would just, my guess would be he was either trying to throw it away and it didn't really look like he was throwing it to anybody except for, you know, and I think that it, it was, I think a hard pass to catch because I hope he wasn't throwing the ball away. He can throw the ball through the end zone. He can throw it in the 10th row of the stands. That's uh -huh. not how you throw the ball away. Well, it was, a, it was, he threw it poorly, but um, it didn't really look like there was anybody that could have caught it other than the person that did. But um, so it was a poorly executed play. But um, I guess the question I still have is like, I don't know, do these coaches not have, I, I would think that they, I would think that some of them have been around long enough that they would know what the right strategy would be at that. And it seems like, I think that was, that wasn't a first down. I don't think it was either second or third down, but you know, I would think that they would have something in there, you know, up their sleeve or something to where it shouldn't be such a, you know, Oh, well, why did they run that? You know, I, I have a question about why there's always like this question about, well, why did he throw that play? And it's like, there's, you have to ask the coach, I guess, to find out the reason, but you know, it ended the game obviously. And, so, I mean, I don't know. It was, I don't know that you can say it was anything other than just a bad play, I guess, to run at the time. Well, I think it's pretty obvious that he didn't see either one of those uh, defenders. I find it hard to believe that he didn't see either of those two defenders, but I'm guessing that he didn't see one of them. It kind of reminds me, even though I know we're talking about two different sports. Do you remember the Super Bowl between Seattle? And uh, kind of reminds me a little bit of that, where that, uh, that defender, I think, intercepted it. Yeah. Right. I mean, it kind of reminded me of that. It's like, well, why didn't they just run it? You know, but then they weren't really that close to where they could have run it. So that's why I just don't, I don't know really what the right play would have been at that time, you know, no. other than maybe to look maybe towards the back of the end zone, maybe. No, Seattle play. got cute in that Super Bowl. They definitely should have run the ball. Well, I think they thought that they would trip, trip up because that uh, running back, I remember, I think that was what they thought they were going to get was the guy running it. And so when they threw it, um, they think they were hoping maybe that would that would catch the defense. Sure. The they Patriots. thought they were going to surprise, yeah, the Patriots. But the Patriots. I, I don't remember the exact uh, uh, situation there, other than them being at like the two and a half yard line. But they should have run the ball. They they had plenty of time to run the ball, and they had the, one of the best, probably the best short yardage running backs in, in the in, in the league.
So. Or maybe, maybe even, I know you said there was time left, but not like 30 seconds, but maybe even just kick the field goal, huh? Just to send it into overtime. Oh, no, 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 no. Well, yeah, if, if you don't have any other options, if you get down to a fourth down or there's only like three seconds left, but no, you've got to try to win the, if you're Utah, you've got the ball at the three yard line with 25 seconds left and it's first or second down. It was second down. I'm watching the play right now. It's on TV right now. So it was second down. There was 22 seconds left in the game. Uh-huh. So yes, you, you have to try to win the game. Sure. Well, no, but I mean, if the option is, if you're not going to execute it, then I would think the better option would be at least to try to win it in overtime. I don't understand exactly. Well, the approach yeah. to any play is to execute it. If they knew that they weren't going to execute it, yes, it would be better to kick a field goal. But when you're when you've got the ball at the three yard line, and there's only and there's still 22 seconds left to play, and it's only second down, you try to win the football game. But you don't think that was a poorly executed play? Absolutely, it was. It was. Oh, okay, it wasn't well. poorly executed by ten players on the field. It was poorly executed by the quarterback. Well, that's the question I have. I would think in that situation, you have a good play drawn up to where it's at least... Before they run the play, they don't know that they're not going to execute it well. <laughs> I guess. I don't know. I guess I just don't understand it. Yeah, right, it, just, it made, it made me want to pull my hair out. It made me mad. I was mad about it. Yeah. Yeah, I was mad because, I mean, I don't really care about Utah, but, I mean, if you're going to lose a game, don't lose it like that. It's, yeah. almost like, it's almost like just giving them the win. It's like... I mean, you fight the whole game to win it, and then you turn it over. And to me, that's just like that's not a way to lose. That's a way to – I don't know. That's not good. There you go. All <laughs> right, Chris. Well, we appreciate you calling. All right. Have a good day. You too. Bye. All right. Uh, let's keep it rolling here at the Voice of College Football. We got Sean coming up next here. Sean, how you doing tonight? Hey, Mark. What's on your mind? Oh, nothing much. I uh, just watch uh, my two uh, the two teams that I follow the most play uh, two of the mar- most marquee matchups on opening weekend. Here, uh, Cincinnati taking it down to the wire against uh, Arkansas, and uh, Buckeyes pulling it out against Notre Dame. So uh, I don't know. I'm uh, I can say I'm. Pleased uh, with both performances, I guess. I don't know. Um, didn't really. I, I bet against my team. I I uh, gave the six and a half to the Reds. Yeah. Oh, the um, the Arkansas Cincinnati game. Gotcha. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I gave the six and a half to the uh, to the Razorbacks because I uh, I wasn't entirely confident. And how uh, the Bearcats will respond to having uh, such massive turnover, but you know, I mean, they they really impressed me with how they uh, performed physically and how they kept fighting in that game. And I think, uh, I mean, th- this is the toughest game on their uh, schedule, sure, um, going forward, and. I mean, they, they blew a lot of chances in this game, to be honest with you. I mean, if you watch that game, just play for play, you know, drive for drive, they uh, they were in there every step of the way with Arkansas. They looked like equally matched teams, especially being on the road. You know, I mean, they, they, they missed two field goals, including one with mm-hmm. like a 26-yard field goal. Sure. Unacceptable. I mean, like you just – and this is the problem that I've had with this program for the past like two, three years is just not getting the kicking game mm-hmm. that old period. I mean, it's it's been kind of a nightmare. I mean, for as detail oriented and of a coach as Luke Fickle is, I mean, this is this is hard to deal with the fact that they can't like convert on easy opportunities like this, but I wasn't expecting them to really athletically be able to hang in there like they did. No. Yeah. They need to find a, um, a field goal kicker. They had the worst percentage in the country last year, but to your point, yeah, I watched the game too. And um, it was, it was a fun game to watch. Those two teams were going after it. Uh, They were hitting, it was a, a high effort game. 
They left it on the field. There's no question. Both teams just left it out there, and it was a hard-fought game. And to your point, physically, Cincinnati was just as good as Arkansas. Basically, the quarterback, Bryant, missed a lot of throws in the first half. And like you said, yeah. just two field goals that were very makeable, especially the second one. Yeah, I mean, this, I mean, you know, you know what, what can you say? I mean, like, I guess the, I guess they are what they are, they are at that point. But I mean, you would like a coach to just be able to, to like find a kicker and like not have to worry too much about making those decisions, fourth down decisions deep down the field. Like, you know, your kicker can make it, you know, you can get three points. And I mean, it just was what it, you know, and I mean the de- the defense uh, certainly missed more tackles than I'm used to seeing them the past few years when they've had that nucleus of guys that had so much experience. There were some breakdowns in there, but I, like I feel fully confident that they at least can compete, if not are the outright favorites for the American title again, which is insane after losing seven guys or uh, nine guys in the NFL draft this past year. And programs like Cincinnati don't usually replace guys like that and move on. And I'm I'm glad to see that they're, they, they look to be on that path. Like, you know, they can clean up a lot of the stuff that cost them the game today. They really can. I mean, that's a tough, that's a very, very tough opening game. So, I mean, I'm just super happy to see that. And um, with the Buckeye game, I mean, losing Smith and Jigba certainly changed uh, the, the inflection of the game entirely throughout. But, you know, the defense looked uh, very, very similar to what I've seen from Oklahoma State over the past couple of years. Just, you know, great gap responsibility guys in the right position, you know, the things that have been like ha- that afflicted them in the game at, against Oregon and Michigan last year seem to be cleaned up for the most part right now. Yeah, it looks like it because the way I see the losses against Oregon and Michigan last year on the defensive side of the ball is that they happen in two completely different ways. They both happened in the running game, but they happen in two different ways. You watch the Oregon game. Everybody's fooled. The scheme didn't work. Everybody's out of position constantly. Right. You know, It wasn't like they didn't miss some tackles or get beat on the line of scrimmage a little bit, but Oregon didn't physically manhandle them, nor were there, their runners breaking many tackles or juking guys out of their uh, jock strap. It was more about the, them just like running that one play to the left edge where nobody's, nobody's in sight. You know, most of those Oregon running plays, there was nobody else on the screen. Uh, the Michigan game, everybody was pretty relatively in position, defended the play, but they just got pushed. They just got leaned on. Um, yeah, just got bullied. Yeah, Michigan didn't fool them. They they ran a couple jet sweep kind of plays that fooled them a little bit. But in terms of the Hassan Haskins, um, all his running plays, yeah, they just bullied them, and and neither happened tonight. Yeah, so I mean, like I'm wondering if uh, going forward, if uh, Smith and Jigba's absence tonight is actually going to help Ohio State going forward because they had to win the game in a different way tonight than just, you know, we've got more athletes than you. Try to defend us. All right. Anything else, Sean? No, I'm good. Cool. Well, thanks for calling. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Let's keep it rolling. We got uh, Nick on the line next. Nick, how you doing? Hey, Mark, can you hear me? I got you. Sweet, sweet. Um, Quick question for you here. How and why does Scott Frost still have a job as the head coach at Nebraska? Because I don't get it. 
Yeah, can you imagine if they would have blown that game? Then you got to think that he would have gotten fired. Although, uh, in understanding how the buyout works, the buyout's going to drop considerably on, I believe, October 15th. <clears throat> so if you look at their schedule and kind of estimate what are they going to do before October 15th and where are they going to be, that might be at the point that they say see ya. I think we're all kind of feeling that way. Everybody across the country at this point, I'd, I just, I, yeah, I mean, for buyout purposes, sure. But I mean, it's, you could almost say it was a blessing that he was shipped off to Ireland. I don't know how he even got back on the team plane to come <laughs> back, but, uh, I'm going to guess him at three and four on October 15th. They play Purdue on the road October 15th. So if they win this next game against Georgia Southern, then they lose to <clears> Oklahoma. <throat> They're two and two. And then they've got Indiana and Rutgers on the road. Do they split those two? They're three and three and they lose to Purdue and they're three and four or shoot the way Indiana and Rutgers looked last night and today. <clears throat> shoot, They might lose both of those games. Yeah. I mean, I, do you think if he gets fired, um, they would just pick Mark Whipple as the interim? For the yeah, that's season? the name, first name that comes to mind for me. Okay. Who was, who was last a head coach? He was a head coach like 10 years ago somewhere, somewhere small. Well, who knows? I mean, sometimes I, maybe he could do a good job. I've, it's sure. just it's like five, five and 21. In one score games, isn't that, that the worst yeah. record of all time? Like since that's, that's yeah, that at this point, Nick, it's not a coincidence. Like I had somebody try to tell me last week that that was just some kind of fluke or something, or look at how good they're playing against certain teams or did last year. And I said, this is the kind of the way they played last season are the kind of results that you get encouraged by the first season. Yeah. When you're like, okay, Mike Riley left. They just went five and seven. Okay. Maybe even though the record was a step back, they're competing against Michigan, Michigan State, Ohio State, et cetera, like they did in Frost's first year. In Frost's first year, they lost the first six games. But I get the, we're putting in a new system, new terminology, new relationships with coaching staffs. Um, we're weeding out the, the bad culture in the locker room and, Guys are leaving and all that sort of thing. In the last six games of the first season, they they beat they won four games. They beat a couple decent teams, not great teams. They beat like Minnesota and Northwestern or somebody. And they took Ohio State, who was a top three team in the country and won the Rose Bowl that year. They took them to the the wire and they lost to a good Iowa team on the last play of the game. So I thought he's turning this thing around. And then you would expect seven and five the next year or you would expect six and six go to a bowl game in 2019 then you would expect well it was a COVID year but another step of improvement that you know last year should have been an eight and four season minimum and building off of that this year not to your point it's it's become way too much of a trend when you go five and twenty one in one score games that that points directly to a lack of coaching, uh, detail, uh, time management, game management, all of those things. Your well, team I feel like toys. Yes, all those things. I feel like that was exposed even the most. I mean, just go back to the Northwestern Nebraska game. I feel like. If you were watching the entire game, I think if Northwestern was pushing enough, they probably could have thrown on at least another score. But Pat Fitzgerald just basically kind of gave Scott Frost the middle finger and said, I just I think you're going to choke it away because I think that's the coach you are. And that's exactly what happened. So, yeah. But um, another question I had is I was kind of curious with Ryan Day at uh, Big Ten Media Days now that Ohio State's playing against Notre Dame. Um, maybe this has changed slightly, but I was interested to say that, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't you say that he expected a top 10 defense this year with Jim Knowles, Big Ten Media Days? Yes, he said that even more recently than that. And then that 
comment <clears throat> was taken to Jim Knowles, and Jim Knowles said, that's fine. Um, why can't we finish in the top five? Isn't – I mean, I get, I, yeah, I guess I didn't get that. I didn't hear Jim Knowles say that. That's kind of interesting. Why, though, like as a head coach, if you're going to say something like that, must have meant – He's confident enough, and those guys are on the same page, especially, especially hearing from Jim Knowles what you just said. Um, but I'm pretty sure that Jim Knowles' defenses get worse before they get better. Isn't that kind of his track record? Uh, at Oklahoma State it was, yes. Okay. So I brought the same thing up a number of times, talking to Ohio State during the offseason, and I didn't want to say it like, well, because it happened once, it's going to happen again, or predict it to happen, because every situation's different. But I just was bringing to the attention of Ohio State fans, it's not like he walked in to Oklahoma State and they had the 75th-ranked defense, and in year one they had a top-20 defense, and in year two they had a top-5 defense. No, they went in reverse. They had like a top 50 or 55 defense and they went to like 75 and then even the second year they were worse than they were when he got there and then by the third year they started to get better and then of course we're a top five defense statistically i don't think they were a top five defense last year but they were close um, okay and i, I just really thought think it... that just to finish my thought i really think that when ryan day uh and jim knowles and certainly I'll speak for myself. When I talk about top five defense, top 10 defense, I think that the statistics are only an indicator of that. Like they could finish with the 18th ranked defense in the country, but they could have one of the five best defenses in the country. Yeah. And I mean, on top of that, like results on the field, I think are what yeah. matters the most. People aren't going to, who cares if Ohio state had the 26th, ranked defense if they win the national title because sure. the defense yeah. made critical turnovers yeah. you know and, like and it's, yeah if they're throwing up a bunch of shutouts against rutgers in indiana but then they give up 35 against michigan well that's not what we're looking for we're looking for okay you give up 10 or 15 or 20 against rutgers in indiana and still win by four touchdowns that's fine but beat michigan and held them to 17 points, well, that's more successful, even though statistically it may come out worse. Yeah. Yeah, I guess my next question here, um, what after <laughs> – actually, I some of these questions, I tried to call into your last call-in show before Ohio State played, but I still think these are kind of relevant. Um, what's your biggest concern on Ohio State's offense after watching this last game and then on their defense? would you say your two biggest concerns both side of the ball going into the season i noted the other day that i i understand all the hype around ohio state's offense that i don't have to explain that i think anyone who watches and knows players and stats and nfl draft projections understands why their offense is so hyped but at the same time i'm looking at an offense from last year and this is with Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave and what two offensive linemen that are NFL players right now that were on that team that scored 27 points against Michigan, 28 against Oregon, 26 against Nebraska, 26 on offense against Penn State. You know, those aren't prolific scoring totals. Now, they had a lot of yardage in that game, so I know that statistically and just by watching the games, they struggled in the red zone. Last mm -hmm. They struggled in the red zone, and they struggled in short yardage running the football against good defenses. So those were two of my um, concerns coming into this season. Now, after watching tonight's game, I think they seem like a little bit tougher physically and tougher mentally than they were. Uh, certainly Mayan Williams was beating people up in the fourth quarter and that was good to he's, see. He looks like a stud. Yeah. He was really running hard and uh, he's a lot, of, you know, he's got this bowling ball nickname and reputation, but he can run with just about, you know, he reminds me a little bit of Hassan Anybody. Haskins. 
in a sense of physicality. Like I, I they're different yeah. runners, obviously, but I think you sometimes come across these guys who are a little bit underrated who have been in the yeah. program for a while, but they have this mentality about them that seems to pump the offense up. Like it just they bring this energy. Hassan Haskins did that for Michigan last year. You could just kind of feel it when he would take on that first tackle and just plow through. Mayan Williams was doing that tonight. I was really impressed with him. Absolutely, yeah. So so I guess my concern would be, after watching what we watched tonight, that health, anybody can always list that as a concern because if you lose your players, then – you lose the players. So we got to throw that out the window. Anybody can get hurt at any time, but we saw it tonight. Uh, they missed their best wide receiver. I and thought that was huge. I'm sorry. What's that? I said, I thought Smith and Jigba going out of the game was just huge. You could almost just sure, feel the exactly. depression, the yeah. depressed. It was like the air came out of the stadium. Yeah. So he comes out of the game And then even when he came back in the game, you know, I thought the one play that Stroud and Egbuka were not on the same page. I don't know if you remember it. They ran three receivers just at the defense, just to clear out. And then they brought Egbuka across the middle and they wanted him. Well, they didn't want him to. He didn't read. He kept running. Yeah, he kept running, and it made it a tough throw for Stroud because Stroud was trying to lead him, but there was also a defender, so he couldn't lead him Yeah, because he would have thrown a pick, so he kind of threw it in the hole. That's a touchdown if Njigba's in the game. Oh, yeah, he's he's wide open, yes. Egbuka made it look like a bad pass uh, because he kept running. So anyway, my concern is that you know, he uh, Stroud's been working with these younger receivers the whole offseason. And obviously, even last year, he worked with those guys. So you would think that they would be more on the same page. And I know that was only one play. But in watching, you know, and that was at a critical point in the game. I think they were still down 10 to 7 because I think that was before they missed the field goal, that they were still down 10 to 7. And I'm thinking, I think Jackson Smith and Jigba at this point is a decoy. I, I think there's something wrong with him. Well, there's obviously something wrong with him, but I mean, even though he came back into the game, I think they just thought he could run well enough to be a decoy and just tie up defenders. And uh, because otherwise I, w- I would have thought that they would have targeted him in a situation like that, that they needed points. Well, and Stroud's still a relatively young QB. I think people forget that. Yeah. Like this is his, what, like, I mean, not what, but this is his second year. This is the first start of his second year. I think people need to calm down a little bit with him. I just, it still just kind of seems like there's so much pressure, just flack. Like almost people are micro analyzing everything. It's like, he's not a finished product yet. Like I fully believe he's going to be a very good NFL quarterback, but he's, he's young. I mean, so, and then lastly, uh, before I let you go up uh, first, before I ask you this question, um, let's go. wanted to say this. Um, I know you probably didn't watch the Colorado state Michigan game. Mm, um, I had it on a screen, but I, you know, so I kept track of what was going on, but I didn't. I, I figured you didn't watch it because you're a noted, a well-known Colorado State hater. I'm just kidding. kidding. Um, I'm a well-known uh, watcher of the best <laughs> games I can get a, yeah. a hold of. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Um, I'll just give you a heads up here. J.J. McCarthy is going to be starting against Hawaii, um, and he's not going to give that job up. So moving forward, I'm about 99% confident he's going to be the starter. I don't know. Okay see any reason why you'd go back to McCarthy you could just kind of feel it today I think when quarterback battles are going on especially real tense ones you can kind of just feel the pendulum the pendulum swing in a certain direction and he's going to be the starter for the rest of the year Um, and then lastly this is kind of intriguing especially watching Michigan State struggle a little bit with Western Michigan the other night. Um, do you think Michigan State will improve or has 
improved enough defensively to not have the similar outcome against Ohio State this year. And well, that's my final question, so I'm going to let you go. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. Appreciate it. Well, for Ohio State to have the same outcome against Michigan State is obviously highly unlikely, regardless of what happens to Michigan State, because they beat them 56-7 to and they were up 49 nothing at half. So just it's t- statistically highly improbable that they're going to repeat that kind of performance. They're also going on the road at Michigan State. Yeah, I didn't see enough out of Michigan State uh, last night to judge their past defense. I'm sure it's been worked on. I'm sure that was what they were hyper-focused on during the offseason, both from a personnel standpoint and a scheme standpoint to say, hey, we had this team last year where we had two really good wide receivers. I know they lost one of them, Jalen Naylor, but they've got really good wide receivers headed up by Jaden Reed and others, and we got a top 20 or 25 quarterback in the country and we lost Kenneth Walker, but they've, they've filled the, you know, they've not replaced Kenneth Walker. There's no question about that, but between Broussard and Berger and others, they'll be okay at running back. Uh, and the defense was stout against the run. I do think that their issues against the pass are overstated. Statistically, they're overstated. I won't go into a, zillion reasons that I have in the past to explain why, but sure. They, I'm sure that that was their number one priority in the off season was to figure out how they could be better against the past. So I guess the question was, is Ohio state going to beat Michigan state 56 to seven this year? Uh, no, <laughs> they're, they're probably two touchdowns. Well, look at this. They were a, 17-point favorite at home against Notre Dame. Notre Dame's a little bit better than Michigan State. That might, would be my estimation at this point. Um, should Ohio State beat Michigan State? Absolutely. But it's a tricky road game in the Big Ten that they've lost before. All right. Speaking of which, on the other side of this. All right, ball, Mark. Daniel. I'm very happy with how the defense played. I'll start with that. Yeah. The secondary, they shut down Smith and Jigba even before the injury. They really limited the big plays for Ohio State. The D-line also did well. They shut him down before he got injured. I mean, I felt like, when did he get like, injured? Like halfway through the first quarter? Well, yeah, be, before that. Before that, okay. I felt like they did all did a good job. I am eating crow, Cheryl, okay? I'm eating crow. Why? Did you say that uh, Notre Dame was going to win this game? I wasn't going to say we were going to win, but... I was, I don't know. I mean, people, people in the discord were saying you deserve to eat crow. So linebackers could need some work, but that's not my main concern. D line was good. Big problem. Why didn't we throw the football more? Okay. Like we had great pass plays. We just didn't throw the ball enough to make, Ohio State, like, we just kind of handed – I felt like we handed the game to Ohio State in the second half by not throwing the ball because we clearly weren't running the ball. Like, Jack Sawyer, mm-hmm. he destroyed us. He destroyed yeah. us on the run game. And I felt like we had success throwing – we had two good pass plays, to one to Lindsay and one to Lorenzo sure. Stiles. Why didn't well, we do yeah, more of that? There. I just didn't understand why we didn't do more of that. I mean – were we really – LBC, like, I feel like Tyler Bugner is the guy. I feel like he was making the throws. Why weren't we doing more? Like, why well, weren't we doing more throws? I, I can't argue with that because the one thing that he was showing us is that he, for a first start in a situation like that, he didn't throw any bad passes. I know his stats weren't that great because I think that was more – because he got decent protection in the first half and then they started to ramp it up and they started to get to him in the second half. So he started throwing in completions, but he wasn't throwing bad passes. He didn't throw any bad passes. He didn't throw anything that should have been picked off. Um, And they, they seem to design some pass plays that broke open. Yeah. Like I just like, was he scared that he was going to make a mistake? Like, was he just not trusting it? I'm like, we were going to lose the game anyways. 
why don't we start doing more passes to at least try to win when we were playing not to lose when we were already losing? It just like really frustrated me because I felt like we had like I felt like we couldn't have, the defense couldn't have get, like giving up 21 points against that offense. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. How did we only score 10 points against like I'm not saying Ohio State's not an elite defense, but with the talent that we have, we should at least be putting up like 21 points itself. So if I kind of um, read between the lines, uh, is this love fest that everybody has with Marcus Freeman? Is that is there are there uh, a few chinks? I'm mad Marcus. at Tommy Reese, the offensive coordinator. Like, well, sure. I feel like Tommy had really all the good, most of, like. Because I felt like this was the same stuff. We were, I'm not trying to like rail Brian Kelly under the bus for everything, but I felt like we were going to get rid of this conservative play calling once Brian Kelly's gone, but it's still there. And I really like, like, I dare, like, dare I say, dare I say, when Scott Frost gets fired, should we hire someone like Scott Frost to open up the offense a bit? <laughs> like, dare, I mean, I know it sounds stupid. But we got to get better. We got to get more creative offense going if we want to compete. If we want to actually win a playoff game or beat a top five team in the country. I thought we both agreed that they did have creative pass plays. I mean, more. Well, I mean, game. yeah, sorry. Like, my mind's not working, but do more pass plays and not just run the ball when clearly it's not working. Well, like, the thing that clearly I'm wasn't put... working, we, we ran like three run plays. And we went three and out, and I wanted sure. to bang my head against the wall. I'm like, Pass. well, what I'm going to put on Marcus Freeman though is that he's in, he's in charge. So yes, Tommy Reese is offensive coordinator. He calls the plays. But if you get deep into a game, and I don't mean like there's a minute left on the clock. I mean like it's you're into the third quarter, and Ohio State's starting to impose its will on the other side of the ball, and you're and you're Marcus Freeman, and you think, okay, we ran some really exotic pass plays in the first half and got guys open, and we put put didn't put a whole lot of points on the board, but we had nice drives. We didn't close them out. But anyway, we've, we've burned them four or five times. Why aren't we doing that? Um, it's up to Marcus Freeman to go to Tommy Reese and say, um, I don't like the direction we're going with this. Uh, we need to throw it more. Yeah. yeah. And, and I really wanted to see like our friend, like I felt like we could have also used Tobias Merriweather a lot. Like we, I didn't see it. Like people were saying he's like this new good wide receiver recruit and he was kicking butt in camp. Why was he yeah. not out there at all? Cause we had Morrison out there at corner was a freshman and he was probably the best corner on the Irish. And like, why, like we you could use freshman on the defense, like why didn't we bring out Tobias Merriweather on offense to at least try to attack those corners a bit more with Ohio State? Like, I felt like I was watching – this felt to me really similar to the 2020 game against Clemson. Like, I felt like this was a winnable game. Like, Alabama 2020, not a winnable game. Clemson 2018, not a winnable game. But I felt like we could have won this these games if we actually sure. used oh, more could have won this game. plays. Yeah. yeah. And it just sucks that these missed opportunities against to finally like not to beat an elite team. It just, I don't know. Although on one hand, I'm thinking, yes, there's no question if anybody watching that game can see that uh, Ohio State's probably a better team, but Notre Dame could could win that game. They they could have won that game, although maybe it was also a, a just a, a case that Ohio State, the longer they were out there, um, was starting to pull away. Yeah, I mean, I felt like what am I trying to? Th my thought escaped me. I felt like we never went to a plan B on offense. Like clearly running the ball, like I because like I thought the offensive line by Harry Houston, I thought they would be a little bit better, but they still have a ways to go, and we were also missing Jared Patterson. But like, oh, he didn't play. Yeah, he did not play. Okay. He was still out. Okay. I felt like we could have didn't have a plan B. Like, why didn't we have a plan B and like 
for a big game like this. Like, why do we just do the same thing? Like, it's Andy's doing the same thing over and over again. And watching these plays over and over again was driving me insane and very frustrating. Well, well, I think you have a good team. Um, you, you did have quarterback again starting his first game. And he's mm -hmm. played, of course, before mm -hmm. against good teams. But uh, the whole burden of the offense has never been on him. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Can Tony ask his urgent question? Can you come on for a second? Urgent question. Absolutely. Tony, what's going yeah. on? I I just I just flicked on and I, I heard something so ridiculous that I had to come save Will from jumping off the ledge. Oh boy! And that is and, and I don't know maybe I don't think I have a lot of earwax, but did you just say maybe we should hire Scott Frost to help our offense? Yeah. <laughs> well, I I don't right, know. I'm, I'm very frustrated. Well, 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 I'm at a low moment right now. We're gonna get subscription to BetterHelp. Well, we or, do or one of those Tony. online uh, counseling services because <laughs> that is the last thing Notre Dame needs. Oh, we we do understand the Tony, that there are that there are people in life that have certain roles that they can fill, and as long as they don't have decision making power that affect others, they can be serviceable. <laughs> maybe, maybe. I, I I think that Scott Frost has to go to the Saban School for coaches who can't coach real good first, though. Yeah, he needs a couple of years under there uh, before before you put him under Marcus Freeman. Mm -hmm. I also don't see him as a Marcus Freeman style of anything. Yeah, anyway, you're, you're, I, I just yeah. laughed. I thought I thought we got if Will's trying to hire Scott Frost, we got to go save Will. Save yeah. him from the ledge. Hey, your team looks good. They played a heck of a team. There's not a lot you can do. I just, I felt it like, great. I felt like I was watching another big game that we could have won that we didn't win. I think it's a game that you shouldn't have been nearly as close as you were, and I think your guys played like heroes yeah. tonight. So good luck, good, good job, to your Irish. Anyway, sorry, I just had, to, I had to save you from the ledge that has like Scott Frost beneath it. <laughs> All Go right. Irish. Thanks, yeah. Tony. All right. Well, yeah. I just feel like if our offense is like that, we have no chance against Clemson. And if we can't beat Clemson, there's no way we're going to make the college football playoff. And I wanted to at least make the playoff this first year. Uh, I would have to agree. I don't think you're going to make the playoff, although I certainly considered it in my predictions. And and this, this uh, outcome here is pretty much in line with what I thought. I took Notre Dame against the spread. So I I, I, I was I have that but yeah. I want I wasn't one of these you know people that was predicting you know fifty two to twenty like I heard all over the place. All right, well I'm going to go maybe get a little therapy, maybe get a look from other from Tony and the knuckleheads. Yes, we've got quite Wait. a line here, so uh, yeah, I'm going to go. get through it, and we'll move on to Austin. Thanks, Will. There See will be better know. days. Yeah. All right. Bye -bye. All right. Let's bring in Austin. Austin, what's going on tonight? What's happening, Mark? I'm doing well. What's going on with you? Louisville look putrid tonight. 31 to 7. 31 to 7. Oh, yeah. God. Sorry about that. Um, uh, I did not catch much of college game day, but they were going through their picks at the end. So I flipped it on to catch whatever game was on and they rushed through the Louisville uh, Syracuse prediction and somebody picked Syracuse and a few other guys on the set were making fun of them. Like there was no way that Louisville could lose to Syracuse. And I thought, seriously, uh, I think this is going to be a really good game. And it didn't turn out to be a good game, but I was saying that as Syracuse was the underdog, that they could win the game. And, yeah, I'm going to have to look into that one because, man, 31-7. And, Mark, the thing was uh, Cunningham turned the ball over too many times, too. Okay. He had one pass and he, he threw right to the middle linebacker. I don't know if, if the receiver ran the wrong route or – he was trying to push the ball because we were already down 17-7. to 7. This was like in the third. He threw it, and it was right, right in the middle linebacker's hands. It, it was just one of those things, Mark. I just said it's not our night. 
Yeah, I guess not. Yeah, two picks, 152 through the air. Yeah. And, Mark, another thing I found interesting, I caught some of the Notre Dame-Ohio State game. Kurt Hermstrom on the broadcast compared what Notre, the defense Notre Dame was playing, the single high two safety look, mm-hmm. compared it to how the teams are playing the Kansas City Chiefs offense. Yes. What do you think about that, that teams are – that Kurt believes that they're viewing Ohio State as that kind of team? Well, there's obviously similarities between – the, at, at their different levels, there are similarities between the skill of the quarterbacks, the wide receivers, and how much Ryan Day likes to throw the ball, the, the run pass percentage, and the types of throws they like to make downfield. And then if you can frustrate a quarterback who wants to throw the ball downfield and frustrate them with the too high safety look, and we saw it tonight, and Stroud did a nice job of – he did a couple things tonight that he wasn't accustomed to doing last year. He threw the ball outside the pocket more so than he did at any point last year. Um, so he was he looked pretty comfortable getting flushed out of the pocket and still maintaining his eyes downfield and finding open receivers. But they weren't big plays. They were always four- to six-yard throws. Um but yeah, so it's going to be up. Ohio State's going to see this now, especially if Jackson Smith Jigba is hurt. They're going to see what they saw tonight because it was effective. Number one and number two, if the arguably the best wide receiver in the country is injured, then um, this is the way to attack Ohio State: is to keep everything in front of you, make them make a mistake, have to drive the ball downfield, not beat you over the top with a lot of skill and speed. And and the thing that he mentioned too, I thought was very interesting, is a lot of teams he was saying want to put you don't want to play the man to man because they've got a lot of speed. He was saying if you play the single high two safety, you're gonna make him take the check downs and the short throws yeah. and make him run the ball more. And and that's how you beat Ohio State by making them be patient and then they make the mistake. Yeah, the more you keep an offense on the field, which, the more, more thing, and the more plays it takes for them to score, the more likelihood that they're going to make a mistake or commit a penalty. How many penalties did Ohio State's offensive line, DeWan Jones, by himself have? Five? I'm not quite sure, but I have one more thing to, to, to ask sure. before I go. Mark, is it, is it just me or – or am I the only one surprised that Florida hung in as close as they did with Utah? I was thinking Utah's defense was a little better than what they showed tonight. I know it's only week one, but. I got the game that I expected. I got a game in the mid-20s between those two teams. Uh, I thought it was going to be just as it was. It was a dominant uh, run game, defensive game until I think the only reason they started scoring more points in the fourth quarter was because the defenses got tired and worn out and were gassed. So they started to get pushed around a little bit. But I got the game that I expected. Like, I pretty much flipped a coin trying to figure out who was going to win that game. And I just went with experience is what I went with. Uh, But I thought about going with the home team. So uh, it was the coin flip game that I anticipated Thank you very much, Mark, for your time. Thanks, Austin. And I look forward look forward to, to seeing you next time. Go Cards. I appreciate it, Austin. Thank you. All right, let's keep it rolling here. We got Hugh on the line. Hugh, how are you? Oh, hello, uh, Mark. How are you doing today? I'm good. What's going on? Oh, yeah. So, basically, um, is it time to just say, just to throw... Stetson Bennett into the Heisman conversation. Sure. Sure it is. I'm not a big Heisman guy in terms of throwing people into the conversation, and especially after one week, but uh, I'm a Stetson Bennett fan. I I think that uh, when you take a guy that was already playing well 
through the entire season last year and at other times. Now, he, he is a player that would typically make one to three mistakes a game that would be costly in big games before he did what he did at the end of last year. But then I thought, and I, I'm on record as saying this a number of times, that once he pulled off what he pulled off in the national championship game, in the manner in which he did, which is he gets blindsided with four minutes left in the game. They're winning the game. He gets blindsided. The ball gets fluttered up in the air and recovered for a fumble. It gets reviewed for 18 minutes. And obviously at that point, he's he's beside himself because he thinks maybe he blew the national championship game. He's practically in tears on the sideline. Alabama takes that fumble. They score. They take the lead. There's only like four minutes left in the national championship game. They put it on him. He makes a statement to whomever uh, we heard about that uh, I'm not going to be the I'm not going to be the reason we lose this national championship game. He comes out. He throws like three lasers down the field. They score. They take the lead, and the rest is history. That when you are somebody who's in the competitive arena, and you face that kind of adversity, where for your entire career, you've never been good enough. You're only a three star. You're a walk on. There's always somebody that's better. And then you finally have your moment and something that bad happens, especially when you're playing for the team that always loses to Alabama, always finds a way to lose. And now you're the guy that found a way to lose seemingly, but then you overcome that and you win the national championship. I got to think that this guy has so much confidence right now that he is just breaming with confidence. Not that he didn't believe in himself before because you can't win a national championship and do what he did last year without believing in yourself. But now I got to think that he is just so filled with confidence that there's nothing that he thinks that they can't accomplish. And then he went out and played the game that he did today, and the whole team just – Oregon's not a bad football team. I know they're going to hear all day, and there's probably a zillion comments in this chat. Oh, that, no, they're, they're not a bad football team at all. That Oregon's trash and all this other stuff. Well, of course, they're not a great team, but they're not a bad team. They're, they're one of the 15 best teams in college football, and they got mowed down, annihilated. Yes, that's in Bennett's – to be in the Heisman race, sure. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, it, it's it's never, you know, just a bad thing to get run over by a team like Alabama or Georgia in the first game of the season. It's just going to happen. Well, it is a bad thing. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think it is. There are plenty of really good teams that I've gotten, you know, mowed over by Alabama or Georgia in the beginning of the year. Yes, they have. And they – because. You know, typically no, in the beginning of the year, you know, seasons, offense they didn't... is very sluggish. Well, well, the point I'm at, I understand the point you're making, that there's there's no shame in it. Like, if you're going to get blown out by somebody, those are the two teams that you're going to get blown out by, that there's it's understandable. But look at all the teams that have gotten blown out by Alabama to start out a season. They were all decent teams, but none of them turned out to really do anything or accomplish anything. Michigan, USC, West Virginia, uh, Duke, Louisville, Florida State, Wisconsin, all those teams that they, Michigan, that they beat between like 2010 and a couple of years ago and all those neutral site big games to start the season. Miami last year. None of those teams accomplished anything or like um oregon in 2011 yeah against lsu well that was a good oregon team they they did what they won the pac-12 championship 2011 yeah they um shoot i get those stanford oregon matchups mixed up but um they were a top five or 10 team in the country. Anyway, okay, anything well, else you? Okay. Who? Okay. 
were you encouraged by the performance from Anthony Richardson tonight? Yes. Yeah, he played a, a good defense. He... I don't know that he... So once the Ohio State game started, that was the game. Uh, I had both games on, but I wasn't listening to the Florida... Utah game, so I tend to lose track of situations, even though I'm watching every play. Uh, he didn't throw a pick, did he? No, I, I do not believe so. He seemed to two things. He seemed to know when to run and when to throw. You know, he obviously picked a few times to run, especially that one where there was, you know, the entire left side of the field was wide open and he ran whatever 50 yards for a touchdown. Uh, but he seemed to know when to run, when to throw. He also was faced with a few third and long plays that he hung in the pocket and delivered a nice throw. Yeah. And honestly, I feel like, uh, you know, Notre Dame did a little bit better than I thought they would. That game pretty much played out the way I, I thought. I, I well, I shouldn't say that way. I, I thought it would be higher scoring. I picked Ohio State to win by ten. Uh, oh, seems it, like you were pretty spot on. Yeah, I, I've had that ten points in my head pretty much the entire off season. I, I didn't. I was not a believer in this. Ohio State's just going to go out there and throw seven touchdown passes and just annihilate Notre Dame. I, I never did get that line of thinking. Well, honestly, I thought Notre Dame was very overrated, and I did not think that they were a top-10 team whatsoever, and I was completely wrong about that. Well, we'll see. You may not be completely wrong about that. They may end up going 8-4 and four or something. I, I think they're roughly a top-10 team. I think they're in that range, 10 or 12. Well, I, got, I, I honestly kind of felt like they were just, like, I thought that they were going to go, like, seven and five or something really they were just going to be really i thought they were going to be very mediocre yeah. i picked them nine and three but yeah i i guess nine and three you know nine and three maybe ten and two is a possibility sure yeah all right hugh anything else I, absolutely nothing else uh, sure. uh thank you for having me on the show and uh you know Go um, Big Blue. Thanks, you. Appreciate it. Uh, I will mention that uh, I like to um, have some calls coming in, as we have tonight from a number of people that uh, we've never heard from before. So uh, we certainly love to hear from everyone and the old timers as well. But it uh, does my heart good to see some new, fresh blood in the uh, call-in section. So thank you so much for that. And uh, we need to do a better job of posting these links in the description section. That is on me. But uh, we'll take these calls and uh, maybe wrap it up for the night. But we got Tim on the line. Do you want Tony in here at the same time? Oh, yeah, sure. That's fine. All right. Tony. Tim told me to stay. Yeah, I made him. Is Will, is, have we gotten Will off the ledge yet? He's not he's not lusting for Scott Frost anymore. Yeah, the whole Scott Frost thing. I just let that go right <laughs> that was what I was like, I was like, oh my gosh, we're gonna have to get him some counseling. I'll let that go. Yeah. That's just shell shocked. <laughs> That'll wear off tomorrow. That's just he's just kid's just shell shocked right now. Okay, okay. I just I was worried about him. I was worried about him. <laughs> yeah, I don't know who he could select that would be a worse candidate to to want to put on your coaching staff, you know. <laughs> right now, right now, especially. Maybe Iowa. Yeah. We we were a little we were a little concerned we were gonna have to send some protective custody to go get Corey today. Yeah, we need Corey to come on tonight. Oh my I, word. I have did he do a post game? I, I haven't he had did the, a post I game. Yeah. I oh I can't wait to see that. Guys, was was Corey's post game as just traumatic as I can imagine? I did not see it, but I can imagine that he was just beside himself because he's beside himself as as we were. He was beside here. himself before the game. He was beside himself because they let one of their receivers go who lights it up for Purdue. And he's like, you know, we need this guy. And then shoot, then they turn around. They can't 
freaking score one touchdown. Yeah. yeah. Two safeties. Yes, the, the defense outscores the offense at Iowa. Oh, it was it was depressing. It was a riot, though. <laughs> but, hey, Mark, how about those Trojans? 66 on the board. 66 on the board. And I know it's Rice, guys, and those of you that are from Alabama and Ohio State, yeah, yeah, yeah. But those of us that lived through the Clay Helton years, sure. playing solidly, three pick sixes and 66 on Rice, we'll take it. Yeah. We'll Who take else is it. going to put 66 on Rice? They're not giving up 66 to anybody else. I don't see those scores coming in against Rice. So I'm I listening to the 66. I expected the 66. What I like is that 14. Okay. And yeah. really, the 14 should have been seven. Um, there was a really bonehead um, roughing the passer, which was legit. And kid got, um, it was actually uh, targeting that kept a drive going. They would have been punting from their own like 35. So, Mark, we tackled people. Yeah, was, yeah, you must was, have. Yeah, we, we, we didn't do that for two years. We only ran the ball in the end zone twice. I'm going to look up this box score is what I'm going at right now. Nine yeah, three. three in fact, the, the, the statistics are misleading because we had three pick sixes, so the offense didn't get to have three Perfect. drives. Wow. Yeah. Three but, yeah the, the, the defense is as advertised when they said that they're going to be flying around there, causing havoc, making turnovers. Yeah, they gave up 146 on the ground, which was that was a bit alarming to Rice, but 55 of that came on a, a broken play. And they and so I mean, I know all all the all the yards count, but you take those 55 out, and then it's a pretty good showing, I think. Three pick sixes. When is the last time that happened? Uh, it's only happened something like twice since 1990 or something like that. I forget the number. It was uh, ridiculous. your guy Kalen Bullock had one. Yeah, 95 yarder. That was that was a big Ooh. one. Yeah. Wow. And I think Shane Lee had the first one, didn't he? Yeah. Shane Lee had one. And uh, who's the linebacker from my God from Bosco? He huh? was my so favorite. excited. He was Raylan so excited. Raylan Goforth, number 10. Yeah. Wow. Four picks total. Wow. Impressive. Yeah. It was, it was something else. It was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. To see. Again, for folks that have suffered for a while, it was, you, you, you're kind of nervous, like, because, you know, you're afraid of like the, UL, the you know, Nick Staben ULM thing or, you know, and, and and the Frankenstein team really came together and looks pretty good. I mean, granted, first real test is against Stanford next week, but uh, so you, you know we don't want to get like put the cart ahead of the horse. But yeah, Tanner this was exactly what we wanted. Monster. But the, the whole thing also is is, is the is, is how they won. Like I, I've sat through so many games in ninety five degree early early September games. You know Labor Day weekend or Memorial Day weekend where you, you have these guys. Sorry, Labor. You have these guys in dog fights against Western Michigan, for God's sake. You know what I mean? Th those were your, those were your, um, your Helton teams. This is the, finally our, our, our fans got to watch, you know, a game that you should blow out a team. They actually blew out the team. So it's been a long time since USC's had the ability to do that. And so it was refreshing. You guys are just a magnet for Jimmy touchdown. He loves but him. When you come on. He just, whoop. Guy's got Jimmy no Touchdown life. loves him. Apparently, apparently, he gets his lunch money on on Friday or Saturday because he comes out of the woodwork like a cockroach and throws his five dollars around. But the thing is, is now he'll probably be eating top ramen next week because he probably won't be able to afford it. I don't know. <laughs> and and yes, I, Harpoon. Sorry, I I have COVID right now, so I'm not really like thinking straight. Yeah, I know what day uh, Monday is. <laughs> um. The uh, we, we, we I did we, I did laugh as well. If you guys, a lot of you guys, a lot of you guys in the chat always talk about Rice and their marching owl band. Uh, they came. They they described themselves as their announcement said, "We're just like Stanford, but classier." Um, and they were. They were also a little less funny. Actually, a lot less funny than Stanford because they they were a little nicer. <laughs> their hats were absolutely stupid. Yeah, well, their whole I thing was a stupid. Big skit about it, and then SC didn't even wear the uniforms. But you know what? One thing about Caleb, that, which surprised me as well, is he was 19 of 22. Totally, I mean, surgical. And like yeah. Tony said, he didn't have a lot. There were three, you know, there were three pick sixes that kind of changed, you know, getting as many, probably as many possessions as a, as a coaching staff would like to see out of him. But yeah. still, he was uh, for 250, two touchdowns. But the thing about those um, 19 of 22, the 19, it was to like, I think it was the 12 different receivers. Let me count them. Hold on. Yeah, it was 12. 12 receivers. Yeah. So 12, so 19 receptions from 12 different receivers. You know, so I think that Riley, as far as a, a Trojan fan, I'm very happy. 
you know, it seems like he came as advertised and they, they, they threw the ball all over the place and it was, hmm. it was pretty damn good. Hey, yeah. dependent fanatic, your team, your team was uh, almost undefeated last year. Our team was a pathetic four and eight and we beat them uh, pretty actually probably more solidly than you guys beat Colorado state. So we'll take it. Believe me, we'll take it. Yeah. No one's yeah, no one, early no game rice. No one's saying that it's how we beat rice, which is what is impressive for us as Trojan fans, because it's, it's a completely different team. And we want to thank all of you guys too. who came to our USD post game. That was a lot of fun tonight. Uh, yeah, but next time, I know, we know a lot of you guys are watching the Notre Dame game. We hope you'll call in next time, but you guys, you guys, so many of you guys were in the chat and, you know, chatting along and it was a lot, it was a lot of fun with all of you. So we, t- Tim and I wanted to thank you for that. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. But one more Very thing, cool. Tony, um, 2016, did I hear you right? You said that, that none of those teams did anything. Cause I mean, USC did finish number three in the country and won a Rose bowl that year. When? 2016 when when um Alabama did I said that oh so I'm sorry no. there's COVID brain again sorry I was talking to Mark he's directing this oh me. oh okay <clears throat> because they got they got the crap Alabama I, I, know, what, I know what happened yes 52 you, you don't that doing six. anything don't think it's top three finish Didn't... Okay, I, I was making a collective comment over 10 years. I was citing Florida State and Wisconsin and Michigan, all these other teams that went like eight and five, seven and six. Because now I'm not even remember what I was responding to. Something about Alabama. Yeah, you, you would have to remind me even what I was responding to. But I was pointing out the teams. He wanted some kind of response to the teams that lost to Alabama or Georgia as badly as Oregon did. Yeah, no, I mean, I just came in late, and I, and I heard I, that comment. I just heard and you were listing teams, and you listed that Trojan team, and I went, well, wait a minute. You know, was, we went to the Rose Bowl that year. Sure. Yeah, they, and they beat Washington, you know, who finished fourth in the country that year. So it was, it was, a, you know, it was, a, it was a horrible start, but a pretty darn good finish to the year. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Just curious. I, I, I just kept telling the Oregon folks, you know, they, they, they sort of learn, like, especially some of our Oregon friends who we love, like to regularly bring up that USC Alabama game. So um, now they know how that feels. <laughs> so maybe they can let that go a little more. Yeah. Although they didn't, they, come out, would, but... they didn't come That's out true. in full idiot mode. They did not come out Alabama trying to reenact so Catwoman. That so, yeah, that helps. That helps a lot. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think we're in for a big test against Tanner McKee next, next week. At the farm. But what I've seen on our offense, I think that we and with the defense, really, because because Kalen Bullock is is the real deal. Hmm. You know, uh, I, I really him back there is going to we're not going to see any silly long touchdown passes that we've been wa- watching the last two years. So him patrolling the back line is is going to give some fits. Oh, Jimmy Touchdown coming back in here. I tried to find the USC game on TV, but all I could find was the South Florida game. The Southern Juco directionals must be competing for airtime at ESPN. Oh, no, we weren't competing for airtime at ESPN. That was on the Pac-12 network, which good luck if you can find it. But that is it for the Pac-12 network this year, right? USC? Who knows? Supposedly. I would assume so. Supposedly, because I think we have to play one. But uh, we'll see. I mean, UCLA was on there too. UCLA had UCLA broke the record for lowest attendance ever at the Rose Bowl, twenty six thousand. That's rough. So we got a and that's twenty six thousand paid. So we got a four thirty local time game for you two against Stanford, right? On ABC. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, it's it's the national primetime game on ABC. Oh, yes, it is. So cool. that'll be a lot. That'll be a fun one. We hope. Nice. But no, it'll be it'll be a good time, and we hope you guys will join us after that game for uh, USC post game live. Mark, you should join us too. I got a lot of post game shows coming. <laughs> no, it'll be. You it'll guys be don't hope- need me to drop by. We're always glad to have you drop by. But it is the Stanford game. Yeah, I may have something to say. Yeah, that's that's gonna be a good one. You should. You should. Well, actually, I'm gonna be doing this after that game because that's when I pop on here. Okay. Cool. Well, we look forward to it. 
Very but cool. yeah, but again, th thanks everybody. And I, I see Connor's waiting. Connor, your yeah. beeves, nice work. Yeah, beeves are holding up the Pac-12 tonight. Strong contender for the North this year. Yes, they I are. like it. And Washington was, looked good too. That was impressive. Yeah, that Penix Penix threw for three forty-five. Yeah, I I liked it. Oh, on another programming note, I'm a bit confused. Was the Pac-12 chat show on Wednesday night only because of the Thursday games? Is it going to be on Thursday or is it going to be on Wednesday? I thought it was on Wednesday, so we can do whichever. Yeah. Okay. We were going to stay on Wednesday because the, some games were on Thursday, so right. we don't want to cut those games off. Sounds good to me. I was just curious. All right. So everybody, cool. Pac-12, we're calling that the Pac-12 chat show? It's a call-in show, right? Sure. I saw a Pac-12 chat show somewhere. Yeah, that's what we put on the, the thumbnail, but we can do whatever. Whatever you guys want. It's your cool. show. We appreciate it. Hey, thanks again. And again, thanks to everybody who made it, who made it fun in the chat. It was great, great to talk to all of you guys. Yeah, so everybody, we're going to see these two on Wednesday night at 7.30 Eastern, correct? Seven Or no, 7.30 Pacific, 10.30 Eastern. And tomorrow, tomorrow night in the college football yes. after dark. Yes, college football after dark, Sunday night. So. Yeah, I look forward to seeing Ben. Awesome. Those the poor Oregon folks. <laughs> oh, yeah, dependent fanatic. After that Iowa performance, I, I you, know, you might not want to get so excited about that. Oh no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right, Iowa won. We'll take it. And Fatal Gator, thanks again for joining us. We appreciate it. Yeah, Bo Nix is now 0 and 4 against her, and a big 0 and 4 that was today. Yeah. Poor yeah. Bo Nix. That's all right. I think he's gonna I think he's gonna be good as the season goes on. Yeah. So. There will be better days for Oregon. Yeah. Anyway, thanks again, Mark. Thanks, Tony. Appreciate we'll see you guys. Bye. Bye. All right. We've got uh Buyers Vacation Rentals stopping by. Buyers, what's going on? Hey, how's it going, Mark? I'm good. How you doing? You okay. I got gotcha. you. Oh, awesome. So I was at the game. Nice. State Notre Dame game. And uh, <clears throat> I can tell you they had so much pyrotechnics and fireworks and flamethrowers. And they had people parachuting yeah. from far. I mean, it was it was amazing. They put on a show for those recruits there. Um, but I'll make it. I'll make it quick. <clears throat> the offensive line is god awful. I mean, we were getting pushed back. Uh, Stroud was. I mean, had to scramble so much. I don't blame Stroud for not having a great night. I mean, he was definitely inaccurate, but that offensive line was just god awful. It was. It was horrible. Um, <clears throat> Marvin Harrison Jr. dropped a couple passes. I mean. He looked just sloppy. Um, receivers looked sloppy all around. It just—it was a sloppy performance. I mean, I was not impressed with what I saw. <clears throat> um, you know, Mark, I've been saying it for three years now. Mine Williams, mine Williams, mine Williams. I called in your show for two years now talking about mine Williams. He is RB1. He has power and speed. And I've been saying it, Travion Henderson, He's a great back, but he is too small. Kid, I mean, he, he doesn't have much power. And you, you saw Mike Williams take over, just mm -hmm. trucking yeah, into the secondary. Did. And I, I, that kid's going to transfer. He, there's no way he's going to sit RB2. He, he's just – he's RB1 all day. <clears throat> um, the defensive line was okay. Um, didn't really show up to the second half, which is, you know, it's fine. Um, but Stroud, I mean, Stroud just looked off outside of the offensive line. I mean, a lot of his passes were low. Um, he just kind of looked frazzled. I'm not sure if all this fame and him on talk shows and him getting his NIL money and, and all this stuff is in his head now because he didn't look – like himself, I don't know if he's injured because they only threw it down the field maybe 10 times, like past 20 yards. They were doing a bunch of these short throws that you don't really do unless you're in the end zone, red zone, I should say. Um, they should have threw it more. 
I mean, they, they sh- that's that's their bread and butter. They should have threw it downfield way more often. And they need to give the ball to Henderson and the flats and just, just let him run around. But don't run Henderson up the middle. The kid has no power. It's mine Williams all day. I've been saying it for three years. He needs to be the starter. I'm sorry. Henderson is just too small. 215 is not going to get you to a national championship game. So you would use those two in what way in regards to – so you just outlined how you'd use them, but are you, like, giving the ball to Mayan Williams 25 or 30 times and Trey Henderson not at all? What, how would you distribute the football between these two guys? I think it's purely situational. There are times when you want to run up the middle, and there are times when you want to throw it in the flats um, in space. I mean, I, it, Henderson in space is – Electric, no doubt the kid can juke anybody out their ankles, but just he can't really run mow people down like you know my Williams can. And you know I just see my Williams consistently just trucking people, just dragging the line five, six, seven yards first down. I'm like that's what we need. We need that power back because. I mean, I'm just I'm seeing Henderson just like decline. He just he's just slowly declining, and Henry and, and Williams is slowly gaining more ground. And outside of that, in the offensive line being terrible, the receivers I felt like just didn't have that zip, didn't have that energy, that fire. Um, some drop balls that was concerning. So I'm not sure what's going on with that, but it just it did. We are not the number one offense in the nation. We we are not the number one offense in the nation, and I will say our defense looked incredible. You know, we held Notre Dame to ten points. I'll take that. You know, they they saved the day, but our our offense just looked god awful. And we are not going to be able to hang the rest of the season playing like that. It, it was just—it was so sloppy. The play calling was vanilla. It was scared football. I, I just don't understand. I don't understand what I was looking at. <clears throat> well, I agree with most of that. Uh, I don't think it's quite as dire as that. I think Notre Dame had a really good plan on defense, and I think once you remove Jackson Smith and Jigba, that obviously other guys have to step up. Uh, I can't think of other shots they took downfield besides the one Marvin Harrison couldn't hang on to. That was a reminded me when it was in the air and I thought he was going to catch it for a touchdown. It reminded me of one of one of the Rose Bowl shots uh, to the pylon that Stroud placed in there nicely. And then, of course, uh, when the two safeties blitzed and um, Stroud hit Xavier Johnson for the touchdown to take the lead were the two shots they took. My question is, we know a CD shot is surgical, you know, beyond 20 yards. Why are we not sticking to that bread and butter? You know, why do we have to just prove that we can run the ball? We can run the ball. I'm, I'm not worried about that, but that's not how we got to number one offense in the nation. We got it by throwing downfield, running hot routes, and is slicing up the secondary on, on, on the defense. But for some reason, we want to do a bunch of short passes. I don't understand why. You don't want to throw it downfield. It was, it was, it was scared football, and I didn't quite – I mean, I understood that the offensive line uh, was getting pushed back so hard, and it was kind of sad to see. But even still, there were some plays where he could have threw it down, you know, 20, 25 yards, and it would have been great, but – it's like they want to prove they can throw the ball five yards, ten yards. You know, it's something to prove there. I don't, I don't quite understand it. Go back to what we did, you know, last year. Throw the ball as much as you can. Run it when you can as well. But you have three day shot. He's a Heisman candidate. Use that. That's the, that's your proven factor, not Henderson. I mean, Henderson, he's good. Williams is good, but that's not your bread and butter. You know. Go stick with what works. Don't change what's not broken. The defense is fixed. Great. Do what you did last year on offense. It'll be fantastic. 
But that's all I got for you, Mike. I don't want to yeah. hang on to you any longer, but that, that's my two cents. I appreciate it, buyers. All right, thanks, Mark. Bye. Have a good one. All right. I think we're going to wrap it up with uh, our guy, Connor, who's got to be elated in what was supposed to be a close game against Boise State that um, I can't really analyze from here, but I had it on the entire time. And Oregon State, shout out to a lead. Um, and uh, obviously the defense played well as as well because they gave up 17 points, but most of that was after the game was decided. So, Connor, how you doing? Oh, I'm good. Let's go. Yeah, that was impressive. Throw us up there. Yeah. There you go. There you go. I can't so, seem to get my hat on right. That's a nice Screw win. It. That's a nice win. That was fun. We let Boise come back a little, which was weird. Uh, I think 34-17 final score. Yeah. But that's about what I was expecting. Okay. Honestly. I uh, I didn't really think think too much about my prediction on that game. I was an Oregon State guy the whole way, even given the three points or whatever. I felt pretty confident there, but uh, I'm somewhat surprised that you shot out 17 zip and uh, never really were challenged at all. That's Again, that's, that's impressive. 24 zip at half, yeah. No, yeah. Um, it's all coming together. Yeah, it's a really good win. So are we in your uh, <laughs> not not too early, not too fast? Well, well, it's not the typical Saturday night because we've got two more games to look at. So that's not it's true. coming out for a couple of days. So uh, I, for as much as I would love to throw one out there, we got to see two more games this weekend. So we'll get to it. But uh, I will take all the wins into consideration. So Dominant win. Uh huh. Yeah, absolutely. Were, it was. Yes. Were we the the most dominant Pac-12 victor of the day? Oh, I got to think I mean, so because that's yeah, the best. Yeah, you played. Yes, you had the most dominant performance against the best team. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Although the Arizona win was a nice win. Arizona is where we were two years ago. Yeah. I believe in Jed Fish. Um, and Jaden Delora is a great quarterback. I don't think Cam Ward did too much tonight. Um, I'd venture to say I still like Jaden Delora more than Cam Ward. Um, I'd say, you know, the Mountain West had a had a bad day, but Fresno State is still their best team. So if we can go into Fresno next week and pull out a dominant victory, then, I mean, we'll definitely be in the top 25 by then if we can beat Fresno. But I still think we, we have a chance to be in the top 25 after after tonight's victory. Yeah, by far. You had the best win. Yeah. And uh, the, the biggest thing was Chance Nolan, our quarterback. Yeah. Making a huge leap from year one to year two. I mean, everybody talks about their quarterback getting better in the off season, but I legitimately saw it on the deep balls. Um, his decision-making, he made one bad pass that led to an interception where he was trying to throw it out of bounds. He just didn't throw far enough, but and, and everybody thinks, well, the people that know Oregon State think of the running game first, but mm -hmm. tonight we relied on our, our passing game. So if we can run to back that up, um, there's there's no reason to think that we shouldn't win nine, nine games this year. Well, based on this sample, I would have to agree with that. Yeah, balanced offense, very nice. 292 throwing, 178 rushing. About five yards per carry. Jonathan Smith. I mean, 
it's it's pretty cool too because everybody's talking about realignment and the beavers and wazoo are automatically being slotted to be relegated to the mountain west so we go out there and we dominate the top mountain west program over the last 20 years just to say hey no we belong we're still here um i think I don't want to get too high, but we cl- were we had the best performance of the day for the Pac-12. I'll just leave it at that. Um, and to go higher, I would say we have the best coaching staff in the Pac-12. Hey, there's Mighty Beef. Let's go. Game day. Week four, week five in Salt Lake City after we beat USC at home. We go to Utah week five. That'll be tough. We play USC Utah back to back. But if we beat Fresno and, and Montana State week three is still, they were in the championship game of the FCS. So that's a good FCS win if there's yep. such a thing. So, I don't know if you remember, but last year I called in talking about Jack Coletto. Yeah. He, I do. Yeah. He's a linebacker. He's a backup quarterback. He plays fullback. He catches yeah. the ball. Uh, he does everything. I think He had a fumble recovery and and a touchdown. I know that. I don't, I, I don't know more yeah. than that. Is, he had uh, three carries for 44 yards and a touchdown. Yeah. Jack Coletto, the jackhammer package. I think I saw him grab the grab a jackhammer and go finish construction on the on Racer Stadium at one point. Yeah, I can't believe it. <laughs> he that's, put on a hard hat. That's pretty crazy. <laughs> that is pretty crazy. We need to figure out our, our go-to running back, though, because – the last three years, Jamar Jefferson, B.J. Baylor, Artavis Pierce have all made it into the NFL. And tonight, there was not really a go-to. I think the, the star would have been the freshman, true freshman, Damian Martinez. So maybe we stick with him. Um, I knew the most about Fenwick. Yeah, Fenwick is the South Carolina transfer. He's a downhill runner, and uh, our O-line, Mikhail Check, our, our – uh, our O line coach runs more of a, a zone blocking scheme, and I think you need more vision than just running north and south like Fenwick does. Fenwick is more of a power back, whereas uh, Damian Martinez and then Trello, uh, Jam Griffin didn't play tonight, but those guys are more vision, uh, patient runners than, than Deshaun Fenwick. Yep. So Fresno State next week, that, that'll be huge. Yeah, I see um, that. Where do you see that game going? 7.30 local out there, CBS Sportsnet. At Fresno. Well, yes. Yeah, Jack Hainer, Fresno State, lost to Arizona by 18 points. I'm really surprised by that, first and foremost. So uh, I don't know what that says about I. I know that Fresno State is not falling apart, so I know that Arizona has obviously improved considerably, and I'm guessing that if the two teams played multiple times that they wouldn't be losing by 18 points. No, no, Arizona beat San Diego State. Oh, San Diego State. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, it's late Maybe. for you. I don't yes. – uh, the, the Mountain West has not fared well. San Diego State lost Arizona, which I think Arizona is on the rise. But that aside, like Fresno State – from yeah, the people that I was okay, the people that I was tweeting with back and forth on the Boise side are all touting, oh Fresno State, just wait until that game. Like that's the best team in the Mountain West, which it probably is. But I mean, San Diego State got killed, Hawaii got killed last week, Colorado State got killed today. Um, obviously, we dominated Boise State, so the Mountain West. I just I like to, I know you're hard on the Pac-12, but I still think there's a, a significant gap. 
between P5, G5, and especially Mountain West this year is, is being proven. I wish Utah would have won. Do you think Utah gains any style points slash any sort of victory for the Pac-12 for, for taking it to the wire, or should they have won that game? That's a great question because I think there's a lot of different ways to look at it. But the two primary ones would be on the on the downside for Utah until Florida proves otherwise. People are going to look at that as beating the fill in the blank, the eighth best team in the SEC, the ninth best team, something in that range until Florida. An average SEC. Yeah, an average SEC team until proven otherwise. Um, and, and you know how it is that a lot of people that vote and commentate on these things didn't necessarily watch the game or may see some highlights or a box score or whatever. And, and, you know, it's just kind of a, you you either win or you lose, not let's evaluate the game. I watched the entire game. I evaluate it as. You know, they're traveling cross country. They're playing in the swamp. It's a difficult place to play. You know, that would be a completely different game if they played in Salt Lake City. Um, if if they run and execute better inside the five-yard line on two trips in the fourth quarter, they win the game for sure. They may win by two scores. Um, so I don't... I don't come away. See, some people are just more cut dry, like Florida won the game, they're better. I don't think you can do that. You can say, of course, the result is all that counts, but I don't come away from that thinking that Florida is better than Utah. I come away from it thinking those teams are pretty comparable, Mm -hmm. uh, but they did play in the swamp, and that's a nice advantage um, for Florida. They were, there's certainly two top 30 teams. Yep. Probably top yeah. 20 mm-hmm. by the end of the year. I think Florida's out of the East is probably the front runner behind Georgia. I know Kentucky gets hype and, and Tennessee gets hype, but f- the Florida athletes going to the swamp um, and AR, AR, oh, he doesn't like AR 15 anymore. Um, but Anthony Richardson. The one play he the fifty yard run he had, yeah. Because I was comparing him to Cam Newton, but he's fast. Yeah, I mean oh, he yeah. is. And they're they're uh, shoot. No, I was thinking of the Georgia tight end who jumped over the Oregon guy. <laughs> oh my gosh, Georgia's just so much better. And I hate to shit on Oregon; they're my they're my rivals. But like, yeah. they didn't show up at all. I mean, they showed up for a quarter. Their offense was doing some things, mm-hmm. but it's it's going to be Georgia Bama again. Like it, and that kind of sucks because oh, really you can sucks. already see it after one week. Like Ohio State didn't do enough against Notre Dame to say that they're on level with Georgia or Bama. To me, in my no, eyes, they didn't for me either. But that doesn't mean that they can't win a playoff game. That's that's fair, a play, a, but a, a playoff game. But then they, at this point in the season, would get blown out by either Georgia or Bama. Not blown out, mm. two two scores. Um. Well, y- yeah, I understand your your line of reasoning there. It makes sense, but I I don't think we can just use the transitive property to yeah. say. But, but I get your line of reasoning. Yeah, I came into this season saying, in my estimation, those are the two best teams. Uh, Ohio State could eclipse one of them or maybe both of them, but I was the most sure about Alabama and Georgia and Ohio State I had questions about. Yeah. And Michigan, too. Michigan did nothing to help their cause today. Yeah. yeah. They were whatever. I think um, – okay, so if you were to put Oregon State in the Big Ten right now, hmm. yeah, where do they fall? Wow. Just curious a, myself. That's a great question. I don't know if I could put them in an exact 
slot. I could say they're in a group of. They're in the middle somewhere. Oh, absolutely. Um, they're in a group of Minnesota, Purdue. I don't know what to think of Iowa right this second. <laughs> two two safeties. Have you ever seen that before? No. Seven to three with. I mean. But I don't want to make too much out of one game. We know what Iowa keeps winning every yeah. year and going. I don't want to eight, trash four, on Iowa because their no. defense is legit. Michigan State looked bad, to say the least. Um, Penn State beat Purdue, sure. Um, so I, I would say we're somewhere around like five if we were to go to the Big Ten. Jonathan Smith, okay. I'm, I'm too early. I'm premature, and I don't want to get ahead of myself. But Jonathan Smith, like how much fun. I don't know if you watched any of the Oregon State game, but like – that offense get it on here. How much fun is that offense? I mean, yeah, you could pair it with most teams in the country. Like, I want to watch an Oregon State game over. I mean, I'll put, I'll put us in the top ten for being most fun offense. You're and buying. Chance Nolan, maybe it it doesn't even matter. That, I mean, because Jonathan Smith took Jake Luton in his second year who's now playing in the NFL. So it takes time, but the scheme that, that we run in our, our offense is just, yeah, I put us around five, four or five in the, in the big 10. But I mean, as far as the pac 12 goes, we're right there. Well, that, that's one of the reasons why I didn't want to slot you in an exact spot, because until I see more football, I can't separate Penn State, Purdue, Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan State. There's six teams right there. So Oregon State could be three or four, or they could be nine. But prior and to tonight, and there's that much difference between those. Prior to tonight, did you I mean 24 to 0 at halftime? There's no way you saw that coming. Yeah, but it's 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 still let's not over estimate one game. Well, but, but Boise State is a top 30 team. Mm. Yeah. But we Third benched year, Hank Bachmeyer. Hank Bachmeyer was supposed to be one of the, the returning quarterbacks who was going to be one of the dudes. And it took him one quarter to be sat out of the game. So if our offense is great and our defense is now on par, again, you have to put us in your top 25. Right? <laughs> we'll see when it comes out. I'd like to think I, eh, I shouldn't try to try to change your mind. I think we're somewhere 25 to 30. Um, my favorite rankings are the Sagarin, Sagarin rankings. Yeah. S-A-G-A-R-I-N. Do you yeah. know those? Oh, yeah. I Bob Sagarin. Yep. I think and, that's the first name. Oh, yeah. I was looking at Sagarin ratings when I was like nine years old. They used to print them in the sports section of the newspaper. Sagarin. Yeah. I was saying Sagarin. Sagarin. Like yep. Did you know? Well, it is Bob, I believe. Yeah. The, anyway. the Big Ten, both the West and the East, are behind the ACC and the Pac-12. Or no, the Big 12 and the Pac-12 in his rankings. Because... The Big Ten has has trash bringing you down. Whereas Colorado put up a good game last night. They played well against Texas A&M last year. Arizona is supposed to be the bottom feeder. Beat SDSU today handily. The Pac-12 you're North trying, especially. You're, you're trying to sell me on the Pac-12 and the ACC being better than the Big Ten? Well, per, per Sagarin. Rankings. Okay. Well, I'm not believing his rankings. You watched them when you were nine. <laughs> and you're now 39. Yeah, I'll take 39. <laughs> yeah, 39. No, I, I just think the bottom of the Big Ten pulls you down a lot. Like, why, why bring Rutgers 
in Maryland, in Illinois, Indiana. But I shouldn't speak because they probably would compete. The Pac-12 has no no leg to stand on. I just you you and Dereal especially if yes. Dereal's watching, you guys love to trash the Pac-12, and I get it. The last few years. Well, you, you have to understand, Connor, I am not on our campaign to trash the Pac-12. I would trash whatever conference has fair. earned being trashed. That's it's fair. I wish Utah would have won. Uh, that would have changed the whole day. Pac-12 would have been, oh, we're back. Well, not Oregon. That was all. Yeah, I, I was looking at a good day. Well, you know what the deal is, is that the only two games that anybody cared about nationally were Oregon, Georgia, and Utah, Florida. But yeah. we, we look at the whole landscape. Um, what but Oregon mean, State is probably the only team that helped that cause. And Arizona, yes. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. What needed to happen was Oregon needed to just play a reasonable game. You know, lose 34-17 kind of thing. And then Utah needed to close out the deal and win the game. And that would have been a really good day for the Pac-12. Do you think – I still think that Utah was the better team. And I – gosh. Like, just throw the ball out of bounds, Cam Rising. Kick yeah. a field goal, go to overtime. Sure. Give it to Tavion Thomas. Yeah. Throw the ball out of bounds, and it's third down, and there's still yeah, he can 19 still try seconds again. left in the game. Gosh. Yeah, they were I, I up though. I, I mean, I think people were talking about the humidity and the heat, and I was saying that nah, doesn't factor in. But Utah players were starting to get beat down, and Florida yeah. was getting chippy. It's just different. Like, I, it just looked like Florida bigger, better, faster athletes versus like a disciplined, good Utah team, mm-hmm. where even like even their tight ends, like people. We'll say Utah's tight ends are some of the best, but like they were getting beaten up too. Kincaid and Keithy. Yeah. Utah, I, I figured honestly more recently before the game that like the talent level on Florida's side, it was just too fast, too. And I think Napier proved a lot with his style of offense. Mm-hmm. It looked like a well run, well old machine. Running an NFL style offense, they were changing their their line of scrimmage up b- before before they hiked the ball on every down. Like you couldn't predict what they were going to do. So maybe Florida can push in the SEC East. I think they're probably the clear favorite behind Georgia now, after what they did today. Sorry, Daryl, but Kentucky, Tennessee. Florida still has the guys they have. I mean, the swamp was a great environment. That was that was probably the funnest game of the day. That was probably the funnest game of the season. It was yeah. probably the best game so far this season. Well, to your point, they do have dudes, and they were just uh, – the whole situation was just so dysfunctional last year. Yeah. Uh, once uh, Mullen started to do crazy things and say dumb things and – yeah, it all went off the rails. You know, they they played Alabama to to the wire last year. Yeah, I, the talent is there. They're still like as much as Miami and Florida State want to say that they're going to compete for that talent base. Florida still has the lore of, and their their new facilities look amazing. I'm surprised George isn't on here. He could hop on and talk about it. I haven't seen George uh, all day. We are ready to shut down here, Connor. Yeah, yeah, my bad. So no, you're good. Late, but I'm glad that the Beavs were the last team of the day, and we we made the the final statement of the day to say, "Hey, we do not belong in the Mountain West. We're two steps above the Mountain West. Throw us your best opponent." And I'm going to knock on wood because we still have to play Fresno State. Um, but it sucks that we only had twenty seven thousand in the stadium tonight because we're rebuilding. But if we stick in the Pac-12 with Jonathan Smith, the North is wide open. I know there's not divisions anymore, but 
Yep. Excellent win, Connor. We Go appreciate beach. it. We'll look up. Um, we will look forward to the Fresno State game. Top 25. That makes sense. <laughs> we shall see. All right. Good night, my friend. days away. Thanks, Connor. Congratulations. Yeah. Take see care. You. Thanks, man. Yes. The aforementioned top 25 that actually makes sense. If you don't know what uh, Connor was talking about, yeah, we post our top 25. And I came up with this because I used to tear to shreds the AP and the coaches poll after they came out. And there were various results um, that showed that their rankings didn't make sense. So I thought, you know what? We're going to produce a top 25 that actually makes sense. So, so expect to be surprised, to be shocked. And some of you will be pissed off when you see the top 25 that comes out on Tuesday morning after the Clemson Georgia Tech game on Monday night, because you'll think this doesn't make any sense. But if we are just going by the results on the field, the performance on the field, it will all make sense to you. So just give it a chance. All right, everyone. Appreciate you being here. We will come back um, with a lot of content tomorrow. I've got a lot of ideas about, uh, of course, what we saw over the weekend and then what projects toward week two. We'll have previews of week two and all the regular shows. Um, we will be back live with the college football after dark show on a Sunday night after LSU, Florida state, I'm going to do Florida state post game on the Florida state live, uh, Florida state channel and LSU, um, post game here as well. College football's back and we still have two more games this weekend. So enjoy, and we will see you soon. <laughs>